Hey, welcome, and thank you for being here. This video is designed for people to relax or sleep to. What do you think of this background? Honestly, my favorite place to go is the ocean, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. So I decided to make a video with the ocean. I hope you like it. Before we begin, I just want to remind you about Chilling, the new horror platform. You can listen to thousands of scary stories on Chilling, most of which have not been on YouTube. And you can adjust the background sounds to fit your mood without affecting the stories. For example, you can switch between rain, campfire, or just creepy background music whenever you want. You can make this switch without affecting the story you're listening to. Like when you're watching my videos and there's rain in the background, obviously you can't change it to a campfire, right? But with chilling, you can. Also, we have a bunch of narrators from YouTube on chilling, like myself, The Dark Somnium, Let's Read, Mr. Creepypasta, Swamp Dweller, and more. In addition, we also have a handful of professional, amazing narrators. Go check it out if you haven't. If you like scary stories on YouTube, I promise you will like Chilling too. Also, Chilling 2.0 is almost ready to launch. Pretty soon we will have full-length novels, podcasts, and even movies and short horror films. So if you're like me and you love horror, you need to check it out. Lastly, just like in all of my videos, I only have three ads after the first three stories. The rest of the video will be ad-free. This is my minimal ad promise. This is the way it'll always be on my channel. You chose to be here, so I want you to enjoy the video and not a ton of ads that ruin the experience. I hope you enjoy. Now, let's begin. This happened in Antioch, California. It was around 2 a.m. I was at a friend's house, safe in warm, sheltered suburbia. We were having a lot to drink, chit-chatting, enjoying ourselves. Of course, when you're having fun, time hits the fast-forward button, and those few minutes turn into an hour. I had too much to drink. My friend has a bit of an abrupt bedtime so I had to dodge out early, still intoxicated. I felt too shameful thinking I would be asking too much to stay in his house, to sleep off the drunkenness. I suppose he was either too rude or too drunk to consider it himself. Whatever. Sometimes a little inconvenience makes you appreciate everything else. I needed about another hour or so to sober up and drive back. As fast as time passed during my stay it decided to drastically slow down as soon as I stepped out of his house. It was a cul-de-sac area, a concrete jungle with the stem of the street breaking into a fork. Alongside the road, my car was parked. The only street light that worked was in the middle of the cul-de-sac circle, about 80 yards away. I stumbled towards my car, produced my keys, felt the metal line up, opened my door and shifted to the back seat. Because this was a dark, strange, and unfamiliar neighborhood, I took the leftover newspapers and a sweater in my back seat to cover myself up. I wanted to camouflage myself and not just be some guy awkwardly sitting in his car, waiting for time to pass in order to drive home. I couldn't fall asleep. The uncomfortable feeling of a cheap backseat bed enshrouded in darkness didn't make the chance of slumber easier. It felt too ominous. And of course, my mind began to wander. I thought of worst-case scenarios, like how the police would shine their lights on me through the window, or a drunk driver hitting my car, and... Wait. In the distance, about 100 yards away, I could hear footsteps approaching. The gravel scuffed with each step forward, growing in proximity, but periodically taking stops. I wondered why until it made sense in my mind. 
Whoever it was was probably looking through cars carefully, with the intent to steal one. I couldn't recall how many cars were on the block, but I counted three full stops until he was at my window, breathing. I froze. There was no more than one foot between us. The car encapsulated me as I lay hidden beneath backseat clutter, forming myself into an object, trying my hardest to be unnoticeable, unmoving, and simply not there. I see you, said a 40-plus-year-old man in a perverse baby talk. Imagine when you were playing hide-and-seek and one of your friends tricks you into coming out. He said it in that tone of voice, as if baiting me, like he was questioning whether the clutter in the back seat was just clutter or a person. I did not want to move or check the window. I remained clutter. Give me an Academy Award. My body reacted by minimizing my breathing so much that I felt paralyzed. I dare not look. My eyes fixated on the back of the passenger seat. I did not blink. I did not move. I did not breathe. My heart was pounding so hard it shook my body with each throb. He circled around the car. My ears didn't fail me. I heard the steps. I felt like I was part of the car. I could feel him touching the trunk as he carefully pressed down on it, as if to test the alarm, as if to test me. I was in the middle of fight or flight. I couldn't do either without elevating danger. I was frozen and hoping that he was bluffing. He circled the car again. The door handle to my right jiggled. He was pulling it multiple times. I see you. Same tone, but more agitated and stressed. More convinced that he was trying to make that clutter move. Revealing itself to be of his expectations. That it was me. My muscles tensed like a cow before slaughter. Tap, tap tap. That had to be metal against glass. Take a penny right now and tap your window. A crowbar. A knife. A rock. My eyes fixated on the seat in front of me, never averting my gaze like he was. I was covered enough to where I couldn't see beyond the seat in front of me. I know I couldn't see him, but I could feel his eyes resting on top of me. My name is Poker Face. What's your name? The voice changed in a lower, demented, and serious tone. My mind forced a visual. It wasn't anything human. I already accepted my death. I was ready to be shot in the head, ready to take a life changing bullet, multiple knife wounds. Just make this sleep bearable not excruciating as you drain me of life. I wouldn't know how to react. My thoughts grew dimmer. I imagined my friend waking up the next morning after a calm night of safe and sound sleep, only to discover my mutilated, defiled, and bloodied body hanging outside my car door. It was then I heard nothing but my own heart. What was this person doing now? Just staring at me in the middle of the night? Talking to me? Or a messy pile in the back seat? Time froze. The footsteps were being swallowed in the distance. He left. I waited another hour until the sun showed hints of itself. I jumped in my front seat and bolted out of there. Wide-eyed and sober. This happened to me about 15 years ago. I lived near the ocean, and I frequented a certain spot on the beach all the time. It was a lonely spot, 
and not many people ever really showed up there. This one Saturday afternoon, I was laying out in the sand, in my spot, relaxing and tanning. It's not uncommon for me to fall asleep. I did sometimes if the sun wasn't too hot on my skin. This one particular day, I did. I woke up a while later to the sun now setting, and I realized I had slept for quite a while. I looked to my left and saw a woman sitting near me in the sand, but not a towel. She was wearing jean shorts and a bathing suit top. She had really pretty red hair. At first, I didn't really acknowledge her, but after glancing at her a few times, I noticed she was just staring out into the ocean and did not turn to look at me or anything for that matter. I felt a bit of curiosity and said hello to her. She said hello back, without turning her head to look at me. Right after that, she sprung to her feet and walked away. I thought it was kind of weird, but didn't think too much of it. I'd say about 30 minutes later I packed up my stuff and left. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and I had a great day relaxing there. Once I was home I started making myself dinner. I heard my phone ring, and walked over to my purse on the counter, and pulled it out. It was my mom. We started talking about the usual things, when I noticed a square folded piece of paper sticking out of my purse in the midst of our conversation. My mom continued talking, and I pulled out the paper and unfolded it, confused, because I was pretty sure that I did not put it there. I literally dropped the phone when I read what was written on the paper. It said, I was going to rob you and stab you in the throat, but you just looked so peaceful. I picked up the phone and told my mom what happened, remembering the girl on the beach. We both nearly passed out. I have a very scary story to tell you. I was out of work and was desperate for cash when I looked on Craigslist under gigs a few years back. I responded to several ads, ranging from painting, to helping people move, to cleaning. On a Sunday morning, somebody called me and told me they had some work. They said the job was to clean a kitchen inside a small building that was recently closed down and he was renovating it. He needed me to show up and work in the evening, starting at 7 and ending at like 1 or 2 in the morning, and that was only for tonight, but that he would pay me $200 in cash. That sounded great to me. I had no problem with these hours, as my last job was a graveyard shift anyways. So the man I was talking to gave me the address, and I told him I would be there on time at 7 o'clock. He sounded like a normal, nice guy. I showed up a little before seven and approached the building. This building was amongst many others downtown, but looked eerily lonely in the way that it had no windows and no lights were working outside in front of it. I thought that it might have been a bar that was closed down or something. I knocked on the big wooden door. I heard noise coming from inside and eventually a man opened up. He was tall, had a goatee, and looked to be in his fifties. He greeted me with a smile and asked me to come inside. There was a single lamp lighting the room we were in, and it indeed looked like an old bar. The room wrapped around another smaller room in the center of it. It looked as if he was painting the walls and working to fix the top of the bar, which was rotting old wood. He showed me to the center room, which was a kitchen. The kitchen was very dirty. A couple of old glasses were lying around. The oven was pulled from the wall, showing rotting drywall behind it. Sawdust and dirt was covering everything. He told me I was to clean this kitchen and to get as much done as possible before two in the morning. I told him I would work my butt off and he pointed out some cleaning products sitting on the ground by the wall with some rags to scrub with. I asked him if he had any gloves. He said no, but that the sink in the corner still worked and I could clean my hands when I wanted with that. 
That sucked, and I was a bit hesitant to clean some of the stuff in here without gloves, but I remembered that $200 that he promised, and I moved past my disappointment. He told me while I was cleaning that he was going to be working outside at the bar. I asked where I should begin, and he said scrubbing the baseboards around the room. I told him okay, and he walked out of the room. Fast forward. I had been cleaning for about two hours, making a bit of progress, and I was getting very thirsty. I told myself I would finish this, then that, before exiting the room to ask if there was anything I could drink. I kicked myself for not thinking to bring a water bottle or something. After finishing my goal, I stood up and realized I had not heard him working outside the room at all. I hadn't heard anything as a matter of fact. I walked to the door and opened it. To darkness. Complete pitch black. At that instant, I became very confused and nervous and shouted out, Hey, man, I'm making some good progress in here. Expecting to hear him respond. He didn't. I looked around but seriously could not see anything. I looked back into the kitchen, which was bright and lit up with all the lights on. I peered back out into the dark room. I began taking steps out into the room surrounding the kitchen. After about ten steps, I stopped and was about to speak out again when to my horror, the door slammed shut, and I was engulfed in blinding darkness. I could not see anything, and spun around, waving my arms around the room, walking back towards the kitchen door. My steps were small, as I was afraid I would run into something. And I did. Waving my hands around in front of me, I hit something. Not a door. I hit someone's face. I made a noise and scuttled backwards, not hearing anything. Whoever I had just touched did not react. I backed up completely until I hit a wall and realized I must have been close to the entrance door to the building. I turned and felt around for a doorknob. Luck was on my side as I quickly found it and pulled the door open. It was dark outside at this point, and only a very small amount of moonlight came into the room just enough to where I could see the man standing against the kitchen door with a blank expression on his face. I ran out the door and never looked back. That's the last time I used Craigslist to find work. What was that guy doing? What was he going to do? Makes me sick to think about it. So this happened to my family in early 2002 when my daughter was a baby. My wife and I moved into a new house right after our daughter was born. It was a nice place in the suburbs. I would rather not mention in what city. The house was relatively new and surrounded by other houses with the same exact design and layout. We were still getting used to our new life there with our new baby when one night... We heard the baby crying on the baby monitor. We were watching a movie in the living room, paused it, and went into the baby's room. The baby wanted her bottle. I stood in the doorway of the room while my wife tended to our newborn. I was smiling at the sight of this, when suddenly my wife made a small sound of fear and surprise. She was looking out the window directly beside the crib. I walked over to her, and she didn't say anything. I looked outside and saw a woman that looked to be about our age standing on our lawn and looking into the bedroom window. I went into protective mode and immediately walked out of the room and towards the front door with the intention of confronting her. My wife shouted before I could open the door. She ran away! I ripped the door open and walked outside. I looked around the front of our house and walked a bit further onto the street, looking in both directions. No sign of her. I decided to walk around the whole exterior of my house to make sure this creepy lady had really left. I walked the perimeter of our house and didn't find her anywhere. 
I returned to my house to find my wife still holding the baby in our master bedroom, and I told my wife that I did not find her. After a little while of being creeped out and looking out the windows to make sure she wasn't still lingering around, we decided she was gone for good and went to sleep. The next day, we saw the woman again, this time at night. And this time, my wife was in the shower and I was holding our baby in her bedroom. I saw the woman standing in the same spot on our lawn, peering into the bedroom at me holding my baby. I just looked at her for the longest time, and she didn't move. My wife eventually walked into the room with a towel in her hair and approached me from behind, giving me a hug. I said, She's back. Look. She's just standing there. My wife got incredibly creeped out at this point and insisted that we call the police. I was going to, but felt I wanted to confront her again, so I walked out of the room and opened up the front door, which was only about 10 feet away from the baby's room. I walked outside, and the woman was still there. She turned to me. I walked onto our lawn about 20 feet away from her and said, What are you doing? If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the cops. If I ever see you around here again, I will call them immediately. The woman smiled at me, and then opened her mouth wide, and let out a nightmare-inducing scream that sounded as if she was in pain. I knew right away that this woman was ill, like in the head. She turned around and ran away. This was terrifying, as I realized she was barefoot. She ran away like a little kid would, arms flailing. I went inside and my wife was already holding the phone. A couple police officers came by the house a short while later, and they said there was really nothing they could do except drive around the neighborhood a few times and keep an eye out for her. They said they would call us if they did see her. About 20 minutes after they left, they called and said they didn't see anyone fitting her description. We were disappointed, but eventually fell asleep. After taking turns looking out the windows for hours, I had assumed the woman got the hint. A month had passed, with no sign of her. Then one night, my wife and I were in bed. When I heard a noise, I awoke and glanced at the alarm clock. It read 3.32 a.m. I listened for the noise to continue, and heard giggling coming from the baby monitor. I sat up in bed and my heart stopped. I flew out of the room and into my baby's room to see nothing. My baby was asleep, and my wife had followed me. I was very confused for a moment and thought I didn't actually hear anything. Maybe it was just a nightmare. My wife asked what was wrong. I didn't respond for a few seconds and then finally said, Nothing. I thought I heard something. We both sighed and walked back into our room. My wife went into the room first and upon entering, screamed and then threw herself backwards into me. I gasped and almost fell backwards onto the floor. My wife started repeating, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. My heart pounding, I replied, What? What? I forced my way past her and walked into my bedroom. The woman was sitting Indian style on our bed. I backed up out of the room and slammed the door. My wife ran and took our baby from her crib, and the three of us went outside. As I was closing the front door once we had walked out, I heard our master bedroom door open. Neither of us had our cell phones on us, so we ran to our neighbor's house and started frantically knocking on their front door. They answered very quickly and asked what the matter was. We explained, and they ushered us inside and called the police. The cops showed up shortly after, and they went inside our house. The woman was still there. They said they found her upstairs, sitting in the middle of the hallway, in the dark.
This happened two years ago on our anniversary. My wife and I were celebrating three years married, and we decided to both take the day off work and go for a drive down to the beach. It was a bit of a drive, about three hours one way. The drive was amazing. We had fantastic conversation and enjoyed all the sights on the way out there. When we arrived, there was only a few hours of daytime left, but we didn't mind. We kind of liked the idea of walking along the sand at night to gaze at the stars and listen to the sounds of the ocean peacefully without the usual noise that comes with visiting the beach. We ate dinner at a nice steakhouse right on the water, and when we finished, decided that it was time to hit the beach, finally. From the restaurant, we walked to our car, which was parked in the lot right next to the beach entrance. My wife grabbed a sweater and a blanket, while I grabbed a six-pack and a small cooler I had brought. We headed towards the sand, and went through a very old wooden fence with an opening cut out. We walked out towards the water, and marveled at the sight of it, and the moon lighting our way beautifully. We stopped and chose a nice spot, about 30 yards away from the waves crashing against the sand, and about 70 yards I'd say from the wooden fence leading back to our car, and the small seaside town that we were in. We unfolded the blanket and sat down on top of it. After a few minutes of talking, kissing, and drinking, we laid down. We were truly amazed by all the stars in the sky, and it was a gorgeous night. I'd say about 15 minutes later, I felt a presence. I was still watching the stars, but I felt like there was somebody watching us. I sat up and noticed my wife had drifted off and fell asleep. I looked around the beach and saw nothing. Complete serenity. Then I turned completely around, and this is when my heart stopped. About 15 feet away from us, a man was sitting behind us in the sand. Obviously, I was put on edge, mainly because he didn't speak when he noticed I had seen him. He sat in the sand very close to us, with a giant smile on his face. A giant, creepy smile. I was in shock to see this, and at first, was not even able to speak. I glanced at my wife, who was completely asleep. At that moment, I am not sure why, but I felt like our lives were in very real danger. I looked up and the man reacted. His smile disappeared and turned into an angry look. He then pulled out a huge knife from underneath him. I shook my wife awake and said at the same time, What are you doing? Are you serious? In a scared but firm voice. My wife woke up and focused, spun around to look at the man. At that moment, he smiled again. His giant smile makes me shiver thinking about it, and my wife gasped when she saw he had a knife and didn't say a word. He did not respond to me and instead stood up. He clutched a very big, what looked like kitchen knife, and took a single step towards us. My wife gasped again. I forced myself to do something. I stood up as well and said, What do you want? You can have our phones, our keys. I don't have any cash though, man. The man looked like he didn't care, which was terrifying. He wore a brown suit, kind of wrinkled. It looked like he came out of a trash can. His long brown hair was a mess and he looked homeless. Once again, he didn't reply to me. After about 15 seconds of unnerving silence, he did something. He ran up to us very quickly and my wife screamed. He stopped before he stepped foot on our blanket and once again his smile turned into a crazy and angry looking frown. I spoke one last time. Dude, you can have everything, just be cool. You can have a beer. My voice was cracking. I was petrified. I tried to humanize this guy and make him feel almost welcome to our stuff, like his knife wasn't a big deal. He then spoke to us. He said in a normal, sane voice, I don't drink. 
Then he turned around and started walking away from us. Relief hit me like a ton of bricks. I kneeled down and grasped my wife's shoulder. He continued walking away and then turned around again. He didn't look at us but instead looked up at the sky. He then turned around once more and made his way through the fence and disappeared into town. My wife started tearing up and I said, Let's go. We very quickly grabbed our belongings and started walking down the beach quickly towards a different entrance leading to a parking lot next to the one our car was in. After circling around the huge parking lot, walking around the restaurant we ate at, we saw people laughing and talking outside. They had no idea what we just experienced. We approached our car. We got inside and drove away. We were pretty much silent on the way back home. My wife just hung her head out the window. We haven't gone back to the beach since then. I have a story to tell you. This happened at my house when I was about 11 years old. This one day, I believe I was playing video games when I heard a knock at the door. My parents were in their room talking, and I ran to the door and looked through the window next to it to see who it was. It was a police officer. I thought that was kind of cool, not realizing something could be wrong, and opened up. We had a metal screen that was locked. The police officer first said, I, are your parents home? I told them yes and asked if he would like me to get them. He responded with, Are you sure? There aren't any cars in the driveway or out front. Can you open the screen so I can talk to you for a minute? I said back, Uh, yeah, they're here. Their cars are parked in the driveway. One second. I then yelled out, Dad! And my dad replied, Yeah! I walked over to their bedroom door and told them a policeman was at the door. My dad looked concerned and got up. He walked over to the front door, and the police officer was now gone. My dad looked at me confused and said, There was a cop at the door? He then unlocked the screen and walked outside. I stayed in the house, and my dad walked back in a few seconds later. What did he say? Are you sure it was a cop? I replied, Yeah, he was wearing the outfit. Um, he asked if you or mom were here. My dad shrugged and said, Weird. He didn't say anything else? Did he say something was wrong? I shook my head, no. My dad shrugged again and walked back into his room, while I went to the couch and resumed my video game. A few days later, another police officer came to our house. This time, my dad answered the door. The cop said to my dad, Hello, sir. Sorry to bother you, but we've had some calls from people on this street claiming a man came to their door dressed as a police officer. Did he by chance come by here? My dad told them what happened a few days previous, and then the cops hit my dad with a bombshell. They said that the man was not a cop at all, but a man pretending to be one, trying to locate children who were home alone. When I was 14 years old, I was hospitalized. I broke two ribs riding a dirt bike and had to have minor surgery. I was in the hospital for two days and one night. The night I spent in the hospital, they brought another guy into my room at about 9 o'clock. I was dozing off because of the effect of the painkillers they gave me. They situated the guy, who appeared to be about my age. The nurses eventually left after introducing the guy to me. His name was Ben. After they left, Ben asked me what I was in for. I told him and then asked him the same question. He told me he would rather not say. I thought that was kind of weird. We were both silent for a while until a nurse popped in and asked if we wanted her to put in a movie for us. We both said no. 
The nurse said okay and walked out of the room, turning off the light as she did. Some light from the hallway kept the room barely lit. I looked over at Ben, and his head was facing forward, at the wall. Some time passed, and I adjusted my pillow and tried to get comfortable in order to fall asleep. I was looking at the ceiling of my hospital room and thought about random things, when Ben suddenly asked me, You think you might fall asleep soon? His question caught me off guard and I didn't respond for a few seconds. After thinking about his unusual question, I answered, Um, yeah, probably. I am pretty tired. Why do you ask? Ben then said back, Because, because when you do, I'm going to kill you. For a moment, I thought he was joking, and I even smiled and let out a very small, forced chuckle. He did not smile back. He just looked at the wall. I realized he was asking seriously, and my heart started beating very fast. I finally replied to him. Are you serious, man? He then leaned his head back and said, Yep. I hit the nurse call button on my bed, and she walked into the room promptly. She asked what I needed, and I told her what Ben had said. She looked at him, and still looking at the wall, he said, I will do it. She told him he wasn't funny and that he would be switching rooms. She then called in another nurse and the two of them rolled his bed out of the room. When he rolled by, he covered his head with the covers and screamed in a way that showed me he was very obviously not well. This scared me half to death. About 30 minutes later, the nurse walked back in and I asked who he was and what that was about. She told me not to worry about it and that they put him in a room by himself. I told her that really creeped me out and I was scared and asked if he could possibly get back to my room. She said that was very unlikely as he was blind. Something very creepy happened to me on Christmas. I had celebrated the holiday that morning with my family and went to see my parents. On Christmas night, I had to go into work to finish a proposal I was working on for a new potential client. I obviously didn't want to go into work, but it had to be finished. My work was in a building downtown that is fairly close to a few nightclubs and bars. My office is on the 23rd floor, and in my position, I have an office but most of this floor is filled up with cubicles in the middle. My office is in the far corner next to my boss's office, so to get to my office, I have to walk by all the cubicles. I didn't get there late, probably around 8 or 9, but there was nobody else there. This was my second time going in alone, and it was peaceful. If I let my imagination run wild, however, I would get spooked easily. As I walked the path next to the cubicles, I was reminded of what I was missing at home. While looking at all the Christmas lights strung up, decorating people's workspaces. There were no lights on, but it was lit up enough by all these Christmas lights. I reached my office and unlocked it. I went inside, but didn't close the door. My computer and desk faced away from my door so I couldn't see anyone that approached my door on work days through the huge glass window that I had. I found this annoying as I never knew who was knocking until I got up and opened the door. I sat down and began working as quickly as possible so I could get back home. After a while, I'd say about an hour into it, I heard the main entrance door close. I didn't hear it open but when it closed, it made a noise that was unmistakable. I wasn't spooked at this point, just curious as to who else was unlucky enough to have to come in and finish something. I got up from my desk and walked out onto the floor. I looked around, but didn't see anybody. I said loudly, Hello? Nobody responded. At this moment, I got paranoid and freaked out a little bit because I definitely heard the main entrance door close. 
Somebody was either here and then left, or was still in here and not responding to me. I was just about to turn around and get back to work when I saw a head sticking up out of a cubicle on the opposite side of the floor, looking towards me. I could see that it was a man, but I couldn't make out any details of his face. I thought he must be messing with me, so I shouted over to him. What a time to have to come in, huh? Hoping whoever it was would stand up and laugh. But they didn't. The man didn't move. And this really scared me. So I tried again and said, I can see you, guy. He didn't move. I wasn't sure what to do next and was now very on edge. So I felt through my pocket for my keys and they were there. I started walking down the path towards the entrance door, the whole time watching this guy. As I was walking, he just watched me. I looked over at the entrance door for a second, just one second, and looked back. He was gone. After seeing this, I thought, oh my gosh, he could be moving over to me. So I jogged the rest of the way to the door and went through it. I jogged over to the elevator and hit the button. I turned around quickly, and the door closed as it made the same noise as before. The door thankfully opened immediately, and I went inside and hit the first floor button. The door closed, and I did not see the guy come out that door. I drove home and told my wife what happened. I had to call my boss and tell him as well, so that I had a reason for not finishing my proposal that night. He was understanding, and I went back in two days later with everyone else. I never found out who the guy was or what that was all about. Nothing was stolen or tampered with, to my knowledge. Every Christmas I'm remembered of this creepy encounter from my youth. This happened when I was really young, and even though the situation could have definitely been worse, it left me scared of strangers for a good while. When I was about seven to eight years old, I used to have a classmate whom I adored, Eddie, for the story's sake. I used to go to Eddie's house a lot. His parents owned a small inn in the heart of our little town, and that inn was placed just by a huge grassy field. There was only a small fence separating the inn from the field, so me and Eddie used to skip the fence and go play in that large open space. The field was backed by woods, but they were actually covering a slope above another inn's small parking lot, so when we looked down from the top of that slope, we could see cars parked down there. One day, during the year-end school break, Eddie had the stupid idea of playing with his new BB gun, a fake revolver that shot tiny pellets. I never liked him, so I tried to change his mind but he was very excited to shoot that BB gun into the woods. Off we went then, hopped to the fence, walked through a patch of that field, and entered the woods. We stood on a flat rock that overlooked the slope in the parking lot down in front of us. Eddie started shooting his gun into the air, and the pellets were hitting everywhere. Trees, rocks, the ground, etc. I shot a little bit too, but was more content with just observing him and the surroundings. I remember that the weather wasn't particularly remarkable, but our town was very foggy and humid, so the mossy ground was slippery. I noticed that the slope we were in seemed to have a trail that went down into the parking lot, as if this patch of woods was actually a shortcut from the parking lot to the field behind us, and vice versa. I saw this and told Eddie, who was definitely not paying attention to me, and kept shooting his BB gun. I was getting very hungry and bored, when suddenly Eddie says that he used all of his pellets. He then had the brilliant idea of shooting pebbles instead, and started loading his gun with tiny rocks we found on the ground. I wasn't into this anymore, but I absentmindedly helped him find rubble that would fit into the gun, because there was no indication we would be going back to his house anytime soon. Off he went then, shooting pebbles. This time, however, 
he started aiming down into that parking lot. The space had only one or two cars and nothing more. Eddie was always a daredevil who liked to defy authority, whereas I was always a good girl who loathed confrontation. So, when I saw where he was shooting at, I started getting really nervous and asked him to stop, because he was for sure going to hit the cars eventually. Eddie obviously did not listen and kept shooting rocks at the cars. Between moments of silence and pleading for him to stop, I could hear the pebbles hitting the tires, the ground, and the roof of the cars. Eddie got bored of reloading his gun and just decided to throw the pebbles directly at the cars. By this point, I was annoyed and very scared about the damage he could inflict, so I threatened to leave on my own. He didn't listen, but tried to persuade me to stay, while still throwing the pebbles mercilessly at the cars. A particularly heavy one hit the roof of the closest vehicle, making a very loud noise. Eddie laughed and squat to get even more rocks. I will never forget what happened next. I suddenly heard a muffled male voice coming from the parking lot. This sound, that seemed like a growl, was followed by a man opening the door of one of the cars down there. He was so fast and furious that my mind couldn't process his actual presence up until the moment he started climbing the trail upwards in our direction. Since I was only a child, my head was blank during these initial seconds because I didn't think he actually saw us and knew of our presence. But that was when I noticed his angry, flushed face. He was furious. Nowadays, as an adult, I can fully comprehend his anger but as a child, being yelled at by a rabid stranger was one of my worst nightmares. As the man kept leaping and getting closer to us, I nudged Eddie hard to show him what was happening, but he wasn't paying attention. Like one of those movies in which the character is so stupid, he wastes precious moments of running away. Eddie kept ignoring me. I nervously said something about a guy chasing us, but he kept brushing it off. By the time the man was a few meters away, I screamed in horror and turned back towards the field, racing away. Luckily, Eddie must have understood the situation and came along. We sprinted down the field, terrified. I looked back and saw the irate man still chasing us, yelling about us ruining his car, that we were going to pay for this, and that he would kill us. Again, now, I totally understand the irritating situation this would be for a grown-up. It's your car. I get it. But the anger in that man was incredibly beyond measure or reason. A normal adult would be mad and could even scream at the children. But I don't think chasing seven-year-olds yelling that you'll murder them is an indication of a sound mind. I was absolutely terrified but glad that my instincts were fast, and I didn't freeze. Racing through the field, we spotted the fence to Eddie's house. We looked frantically at each other and instantly knew we weren't going to be fast enough to climb it, so we kept running. This particular field was surrounded by thick trees on all sides, except by that fence. That meant we were going to hit the trees if we kept running. It wasn't a good option to throw yourself into trees if you're running away from a crazy, angry man. But we had literally no option. To my horror, the guy was getting closer and closer to us, reaching his hand like he wanted to grab us, all the while screaming profanities. I was bawling my eyes out when we got to the trees and stared into each other's panicked faces. Then... We literally threw ourselves into those extremely thick trees and went into them as far as we could. Luckily, these were bushy trees that had foliage from top to bottom, so they formed some kind of fortress that you had to literally fight to get into. We held hands and got deep into those bushes, trying to lose the man who finally got to the trees and kept screaming at us. I never got a good look at him, but I know I had never seen him before and wouldn't be able to describe him later. In that moment, however, it didn't matter to us. We felt like we were going to face some serious violence if we got caught. In a panicked embrace, 
we finally quieted and stood still in the bushes, praying to God that the frenzied guy wouldn't try to get in there and find us. If he did, we would be done. Thankfully, the man mostly just yelled about how irresponsible little craps we were and how lucky we were that we didn't ruin his car. He threatened us with beatings if he ever saw us again, etc. His voice was absolutely murderous and it hurt my ears to hear all that. He tried to see us through the foliage, but just gave up and went away. It wasn't until half an hour later that we managed to get out of the bushes and run to Eddie's house. The man was nowhere to be seen. We cried and hugged some more, but then laughed a little about it. I guess Eddie went back to that slope to get his gun, but I never returned, and I never will. We never told Eddie's parents because he was scared to have his BB gun confiscated. I told my parents, however, and got scolded, but nothing serious. They knew I was a good child, and this was Eddie's doing, so they mostly just explained to me how dangerous and wrong it was to do all that. I was very weary of strange men for a while after this awful event, but learned my lesson and never touched BB guns or threw pebbles anywhere again. I still wonder about the awful things that angry stranger would have done to us if he did catch us. And I shiver. This story happened to my best friend and I when we were 16 years old, on Halloween night. It happened at my parents' house, which they still live in. Their house is in a very nice neighborhood, and it has a driveway that stretches very long, about a quarter mile down the street. My parents had bought several huge bags of candy for the kids who came by trick-or-treating. There were a lot of other houses on their street, and they knew of a lot of kids who would be coming by. The night was passing. We were playing video games, watching movies, and realized at about 9.30 that not a single trick-or-treater had come by. We thought that was strange and went out on the front porch to see if we could spot any. The street was far off, and I couldn't see anybody. We decided to walk up the driveway and look down the street to see if there were any kids on their way. We began walking and kicking rocks. About halfway up the driveway, we spotted something. There was somebody sitting in the driveway, at the start of it, right next to the street. He was sitting in a wooden chair. We stopped in our tracks. We were pretty sure they were facing the street. The person appeared to be a man, with long brown hair slicked back, that fell over his shoulders. We were tripping out over this because why would somebody be sitting in a chair in our driveway? At first, we planned on going back to the house, as this was extremely creepy. But curiosity grew too much, and we decided to approach the man. We started slowly walking again, and walked even slower the closer we got. We eventually reached the man sitting in a chair. My buddy and I looked at each other, as if to figure out who was going to say something. I turned back to the man and said, Uh, hello? The man turned his head to the left very fast and yelled, If you come any closer, I'll kill you. He then got up and started moving towards us, but we had bolted as soon as he yelled those words. Rocks were being kicked up as we sprinted back to my front porch and reached the front door. I looked down the driveway before we slammed the front door, and for the briefest of seconds, I saw the man was now standing up, halfway down the driveway, headed towards us. We locked the deadbolt and chain. I ran over to the kitchen phone and dialed my father. It took my parents about an hour to get home from the party they were at, and my buddy and I were terrified the whole time. We locked every window, and were hiding in my dad's office until they arrived. To our surprise, they came into the house with a police officer. Apparently, the man sitting in the chair was a disgruntled employee that my father had just let go earlier that day, and he was waiting for my father to come home. 
What was he planning on doing? Who knows? No wonder we didn't see any trick-or-treaters on Halloween. They were scared off by this guy sitting in a chair. I spent the night at my girlfriend's house one night and had to leave really early in the morning to go to work. So early, it was still dark outside when I left and would be for a few more hours. She lived in a rural town about 60 miles from my house and work and when I got in my car and started driving, there wasn't the usual street lights lining the roads to guide me. The only light came from my headlights. About 10 miles into my drive, my car started to slow down and eventually came to a stop. I first checked my gas and it was almost full. I am not very car trouble savvy, so I dug my phone out of my jacket pocket and swiped the screen. Nothing happened. I realized that my phone was dead and immediately after that, I came to the realization that I had forgot to plug it in last night before I went to sleep. So here I was, stuck in my car, on the side of a rural street, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. I started thinking of things to do. I could start walking. No. Horrible idea. It was very dark out here, and I wouldn't be able to see anything while walking, and on top of that, I could get hit by a car. I concluded the only thing I could do was sit in my car and wait for daylight which is a very stressful and scary thing to have to come to terms with. It was winter, and I started getting cold. I tried starting my car over and over, to no avail. I gave up and crossed my arms. I sat in the dark car on the dark street for about 10 minutes just looking into the darkness in front of me, before I squinted my eyes and noticed somebody walking towards my car directly in front of me. They were about 30 yards away, the only thing I could see was the outline of their body. They stopped walking right after I noticed them. I got really scared and just gazed at this outline for the longest time. In a sudden movement, they started walking again, but fast. In a few seconds, they reached my driver's side door and tried opening it. Did they think the car was empty? Did they see me in here? I leaned away from the door and window onto the center console. After failing to open my locked door, they stood there for a moment, and then very suddenly turned and walked away in the direction they came from. I was so confused and creeped out. Why would they walk back that way? I sat there in the dark wondering what just happened. I saw two headlights come on in front of me. The car was parked on the same side of the road as mine, but facing me. Had the person stopped when they saw my car? What would they do next? How did I not see them stop there? After a few moments, they started their engine and turned their car around, driving off down the road. A few hours later, the sun was rising, and a truck stopped next to me and asked if I was having trouble. I asked to use their cell phone, and with it, I called my girlfriend, who picked me up soon after. This horrifying encounter happened on Halloween in 2005. I was taking my daughter trick-or-treating around our neighborhood at around 8.30 when most of the other trick-or-treaters were out. We were going from house to house, filling up her pillowcase, when we decided to make a turn and go far up a street we hadn't gone down before. There were parents, kids, and teens all over the place, and they all seemed to be attracted to a certain house down the street. The house was relatively far, but so well decorated with Halloween stuff, we could tell from a distance that it was a haunted house. My daughter was 10 at the time, and got really excited when she saw it, so I told her I would take her down there. We hit a few houses on the way, but she was very excited to get to the haunted house, that we just skipped most of the other houses on the way. We finally reached the house. It was a single-story home painted white, with no cars in the driveway. 
The garage was open and had two black tarps taped up onto two 10-foot ladders that extended down the driveway and created a tunnel. There were fake spider webs all over the house and tunnel, and skeletons and zombies and such laying around the front yard. We walked into the tunnel, and it led all the way into the house. The tunnel was very well made, with smoke machines creating a very creepy effect as you walked through it. Whoever set this up also had scary music playing throughout the house. The tunnel ended when you reached the inside of the house. My daughter was in front of me. She eagerly and quickly walked into the house. When we first walked in, the living room was set up in a normal fashion, but with fake skeletons sitting on a couch, with their head positioned to look at whoever entered through the tunnel. My daughter acted scared and laughed as she walked into the next portion of the haunted house. It was another tunnel to the right, which I guessed led into a dining room. People were rushing by us, mostly teenagers. I lingered for 10 seconds and then walked into the same tunnel as my daughter. As soon as I did, I saw that she was gone. I figured she must have ran through it. I hurried down the tunnel, and it indeed ended in the dining room. A mummy was sitting at the table along with a vampire and a werewolf decoration. My daughter was not there. I again hurried through into the next black tarp tunnel. Smoke was everywhere in this place. Whoever owned this place must have had like five machines going at once. I walked at a fast pace through the third tunnel and found myself back outside. The third tunnel led you through the front door. I looked around, but didn't see her. I walked out to the street and looked around again. My daughter was nowhere to be seen. Kids and teenagers were all over the place, but my daughter was dressed as a pink rabbit this year and stuck out like a sore thumb. I called her name. After not hearing a reply, I panicked a bit and thought she must have gone back in for a second time. I walked over to the first tunnel entrance and walked through very fast. I got to the living room and called her name again, but louder. I was getting worried and impatient. Just after I did that, I heard her say, No, from somewhere in the house. It sounded like it came from the second tunnel, so I walked back into it and called her name again. This time I heard her say, Daddy. Her voice sounded like somebody had cut it off, but I heard it right next to me. I felt through the tarp and my hand gripped a doorknob. Right at this spot in the tarp, the tarp broke into two pieces and had tape holding them together. I pulled them apart and opened the bedroom door in front of me. The room was dark, but I could still see. A man and a teenage boy were holding my daughter by the arms, and the teen was covering her mouth. I did not expect to see this. I walked into the room and said, Let her go now. They did immediately, and she ran into my arms. I told her to run outside. She did, now crying, and I looked the older man in the eye and he gave me a very, very bad feeling. His eyes were sinister. I whispered to him, If you ever touch her again, I will kill you. I called the cops and told them these two guys had just put their hands on my daughter and were trying to hold her against her will in their house. I walked outside and looked at the house address. I gave it to the cops and walked back inside to find the man and the teen gone. Two cops drove up to the haunted house. Together, we all walked back in, demanding to speak with the homeowner. After about 30 minutes of asking people who lived there, we finally found a woman who claimed the house, and all the decorations were hers. We asked about the two guys, and she seemed genuinely puzzled and disturbed by what we told her. She said it was just her and her two daughters both teenagers that lived there. The older man and the teenage boy were never located, and I never saw them again.
I'm 28 years old, and this is the first time I have thought about this incident in detail because of how traumatizing it was. I met my ex-girlfriend in California in 2010. We had both lived there our whole lives, but decided to move to Maine a couple years after we started dating. She had flown to Maine on a business trip in 2012 and fell in love with everything about it. The small towns, the scenery, and the people. She came home and convinced me to pack up our lives and move there. So we did. We saved up a bunch of money and rented a huge moving truck. The plan was for me to drive the truck across the country while she stayed behind three days to finish her classes at the local community college, which were due to end at that time. I would have just waited until her classes were finished, but we decided to take advantage of an incredibly good deal we were offered from the company who provided the moving truck. She had a car that she had to drive there anyways, while I towed my car behind the moving truck. My brother came with me on the trip. The drive was obviously a very long one, and when my brother and I arrived in Maine, about four days after we had left, we were exhausted. After unloading the truck and sleeping for about 16 hours, we decided to visit the small town of Belfast, which was about 14 miles away from my new house. We ate some seafood at a little family-owned joint, rented a scary movie, and made the drive back. My new house was literally in the middle of nowhere. During the day, the view of the lake in my backyard was stunning. The woods around my house were awesome, and everything was beautiful. At night, the house was incredibly creepy to be in. The whole house had windows completely surrounding it, you could not see anything in those woods looking out those windows at night. But I'm sure if you were standing outside, you could quite easily see in. My brother had a flight booked back to California the following day, and we woke up very early in the morning to drive to Portland, where the airport was. I eventually made it back, alone, and wasn't able to make any phone calls or watch any cable TV, because we had no service out there and no cable or internet hooked up yet. My cell phone did not work anywhere on that property. I had plenty of DVDs to watch, and that was it. When I made it back, I decided to try out my new fishing pole we had bought in town. I wasn't out at the lake very long, as it started to get dark in Maine very early in autumn. I went back to the house and sat in the living room in a chair, looking out the windows at the scenery. My view was getting darker and darker. I turned on all the lights in the house and quickly became creeped out when it became pitch black outside. Imagine being in the middle of the forest in the middle of nowhere at night and looking around. You could not see your own hand if you held it in front of your face. When I say it was pitch black, I mean you can't see anything. I hadn't hung up any curtains or blinds yet, and I had the extremely uneasy feeling that somebody was outside my house, watching me inside, watching me go from room to room, and if they were out there, they could easily do just that. I decided to hang sheets up all over the windows using thumbtacks. I sat on the couch in the living room and put on a comedy movie to try and shake the unnerving feeling I had. It didn't work. I eventually realized I had to try and get some sleep, and my eyelids were becoming sore. I was getting very tired. I covered myself with blankets on the couch and turned on the TV. After a few minutes, my eyes had adjusted, and I could see around the living room very slightly. My eyelids were very heavy now, and I fell asleep. I woke up some time later and it was still night, still very dark. I reached for my bottle of coke I had on the ground in front of me and took a big gulp. I set it back down and looked around the room. I am having difficulty putting these next emotions into words that I can accurately convey to you. My heart began throbbing when I noticed a man 
standing in the corner of the room. I did nothing and said nothing. Not by choice, but because I couldn't. I was frozen. He didn't move, and I was able to think logically for one moment. I'm not sure he knew that I had seen him, or was looking at him, because it was so dark. I had a blanket over me, which might have shrouded my face in shadow, in which he wouldn't be able to see my eyes. After about a minute of gut-wrenching fear, I somehow decided to do something. This was the hardest thing I have ever had to do in my life. I coughed, but it wasn't a real cough. I did it while standing up, in an effort to give him the impression that I did not know he was there. I slowly made it to my feet and walked across the icy cold wood flooring to the bathroom around the corner of the living room. He did not move. I made it to the bathroom and nothing happened. I closed the bathroom door and slowly turned the lock to the upright position. Tears were streaming down my face as I backed up into the bathtub behind me. I was staring at the door. I suddenly realized there was a small window up above the bathtub that I could most likely fit through. I moved by the shower curtain and reached up to the window. Every movement was slow and calculated in an effort to not make any noise. I unlocked the window and tried sliding it to the left to open it. The window began to squeak when I pulled it, and I froze, hoping the man didn't hear me. Just then, I heard a tapping on the bathroom door. Not a knock, but a tap, and it did not sound like the tapping of fingers. It sounded like metal, like he was tapping a weapon of some kind against the door. At this point, I made the realization that the man either knew what I was doing or simply wanted me to know that he was outside the door. Adrenaline took over completely, and I slid the window open and pushed the screen out onto the ground. I tried not to exert any noise as I jumped up and began squeezing my body through the window. My head and upper body were out, and I could not see inside the bathroom anymore. Only the dense, dark woods in front of me. I was pulling my legs through the window when I felt the man grab my foot. Directly after that, before I could react at all, I felt my ankle be sliced open. I let out a noise of shock and surprise as I pulled out of his grasp and fell to the ground. I started heaving and felt as if my heart would explode by this point. I stood up and looked around. I quickly dashed out into the woods and fell to the ground, looking back at the house and the window to the bathroom. I felt down my leg to my ankle, which was throbbing from pain, and brought my hand up to reveal it was covered in blood. The deathly serious situation I was in became real and horrifying. I looked back at the house and suddenly saw the back door fly open and the man started gazing around the darkness surrounding me. He was searching for me. I became a statue on the ground and tried to control my breathing. He had a huge what looked like knife in his hand, was covered in all black. He walked down the back patio steps and started walking into the woods, but not near where I was laying. He was grunting, and soon after, I lost sight of him. I couldn't hear anything anymore. I started frantically looking around, thinking that at any moment he would spot me and plunge the knife into me again. I saw nothing but trees and darkness. There was a bit of snow on the ground from a couple days before, and I was freezing and shaking uncontrollably at this point. About ten minutes later, I saw the man walk out of the trees from where he started and go back into the house. I laid there the rest of the night, and luckily the sun started to rise only about an hour later. After the sun fully illuminated my surroundings, I felt as though the man had probably left, and I felt ready to move. I made it to my feet and walked around the house to the front. 
I saw that the front door was opened completely. I slowly approached it and looked inside. Nothing. I walked in a few steps and grabbed my car keys that were hanging on a hook by the door. I ran back to my car and unlocked it. I got inside and started the engine. I backed out of the long driveway and drove to the little general store a few miles from my house. This is where the story ends. I got away. And so did my visitor. My ankle was pretty badly cut, but healed after a few months with no problems. I suffered minor pneumonia from being outside for the time I had, but nothing too serious became of it. I later found out that an elderly man that lived about two miles down the road from me was killed in his bedroom in the middle of the night. This experience took its toll on mine and my girlfriend's relationship, and I ended up moving back to California after a few months. This incident has made sleep very difficult to achieve, but writing this has oddly enough made me somewhat drowsy. I think maybe I'll attempt to go to sleep right now. Thank you for listening. My girl and I frequent the drive-in theater all the time in the summer. It's May, and I don't think we'll be doing it this year because of what happened last year. I'm not sure if it's different anywhere else, but at the drive-ins closest to us, there's two movies that play on a single screen back-to-back. It's also pretty cheap, so it's an awesome choice for a hot summer night. We were doing our normal thing. We went to the store to get some candy and beer and stuff before heading to the drive-ins to save some money. I'm sure you know the food at any theater is ridiculously overpriced. We made it there about 30 minutes before the first feature started, and people were still showing up and positioning their vehicles. We got the front row with nobody in front of us, which somehow I always managed to get. After 30 minutes of waiting and munching on junk food, the preview started for the first movie. Everything was completely normal up until this point, and during the previews, I heard a noise outside and it sounded like someone had kicked a rock at my truck. Not a lot, it just sounded like one good-sized rock hit my tailgate or something. We thought nothing of it because our focus was on the screen. An hour or so went by, with no other unusual sounds, and we were enjoying the movie, when suddenly we both heard something strange. It sounded like somebody was walking right next to the truck, and dragging their feet heavily. We looked around, but saw nothing. As I was looking around, I spotted a girl in the passenger seat in the car next to us, looking at me. She had a concerned look on her face, and motioned for me to roll down my window. I did, and she immediately said, There is somebody under your truck. This made me feel sick. I knew she wasn't messing with me and I did not know what to say back or what to do. My girl started to quietly freak out, and I asked the girl next to us as quietly as I could, what is the person doing? She said back, I don't know. I was afraid to get out, and I remembered that eerie feeling I had when I was a kid, and I didn't want to step off my bed at night for fear of somebody underneath. Same feeling. I decided to call the drive-in's number listed online and told them what was happening. After asking the details of my truck, they said they would send somebody over to us. Well, before anyone came, we very suddenly heard more noise under us, and then a girl wearing a dress crawled out from under my truck right in front of us and began walking backwards towards the movie screen, all the while staring into the truck at us. When she got to the screen, she turned and walked away towards the fence that separated our lot from the one next to us. A few minutes later, an employee approached my window, and I told him that she had walked away.
I was ten years old and being wheeled into the hospital late at night. I remember seeing Christmas lights decorating the front of the hospital. Once I was inside, I remember the doctor telling my parents that I had pneumonia and my mom started to cry. Those are the only things I remember about my visit, up until I was left alone on the first night. I have no idea what time it was when this occurred, but probably very late at night. Everyone else in the rooms around me were sleeping, and so was I, until I heard something. I was facing the center of the room when I opened my eyes. I heard someone's shoes squeaking on the floor outside my hospital room. I turned over and saw a nurse walk by, but she had walked out of my vision past my window before I could see her face. About two seconds passed, and then I saw her walk by again. This is when my heart stopped beating because of what exactly I saw. She was walking by at a very fast pace and was looking directly at me through the window in an exaggerated stare, meaning she was walking by but had her head turned completely to the right side as she did, not able to see in front of her as she walked, just staring at me. Very quickly, she was out of sight again. Then suddenly, she started walking by again in the opposite direction. She was walking back and forth in front of my window. This time, her head turned completely to the left, again staring into my eyes. She had brown hair that was messed up, and she looked insane. On this pass, I noticed that her eyes were opened very wide. At this point, I thought my heart would explode because of how it was beating and how scared I was. Nobody else was in sight. When she walked out of my vision, a second later, she was walking by again. Every time, her head turned to the side looking at me. I remember thinking, even at 10 years old, that something about her was very wrong. I didn't move a muscle and could do nothing except just watch this incredibly scary woman walk back and forth in front of my window. One of the times she walked by, she was smiling a huge, sickening smile that made tears well up in my eyes. Every time she walked by, she could not see what was in front of her, because the only thing she wanted to see was me, in my bed, through my window. It seemed like several minutes had passed until finally she did not walk by again. She simply walked by one last time and then was gone. I sat there in my bed and peered out my window expecting her to walk by again at any moment, but she didn't. I must have stared up my window for the better part of an hour before my eyes got so heavy that I fell asleep. The next morning I awoke with my dad sitting in a chair next to my bed, reading a book. He smiled when he saw that I was awake, and I told him what I saw before I fell asleep. He didn't seem to be scared by this, or even very alarmed. He asked me if I was sure it wasn't a dream. I was 100% sure then, and I am 100% sure now. The woman was real. It happened, and she was wearing the same thing as every other nurse I saw. I was in the hospital for two weeks and did not see her again. I am in my 30s, and I am about to tell you of the scariest night of my life. I had just gotten home from work at around 6 p.m., my wife and daughter had decided to visit my wife's parents that evening and left my young son and myself alone. It was a long, tough day at work, and I found myself drifting off while reading on my bed. Meanwhile, my son was watching TV in his room. His door was shut. I drifted off into full-on slumber when something awoke me. Not a sound or anything, just a sickening feeling of dread. I got up out of bed and saw my dog was lying on the ground next to me, as she was when I laid down a little over two hours ago. It was around 8.30 at this time now, and I realized my wife and daughter were still gone. I walked into the living room and saw that my house was completely dark. 
I walked to my son's bedroom and opened the door. Extreme uneasiness came over me as I opened his door to darkness. He was nowhere to be found. I immediately did an about face and stomped down the hall, yelling his name. No response. I stood in the pitch black kitchen for a moment, trying to comprehend what was happening and where my son could be. I pulled my cell phone out of my pocket and dialed my wife. Hello? Baby, is John with you? Did you guys come home? I felt my heart sink into my stomach when she said a firm and confused. No. She then asked, What do you mean? Where is he? I stood in the darkness and felt like I was going to explode with pure fear. He's not in the house. I'm going to call Brandon's house. He's probably... My wife cut me off in a bold tone. What do you mean he's not there? I told her I would call her right back. I called Brandon's house phone, and his mother answered after a few rings. Hi, Teresa. Is John over there? She sounded confused and replied, Yes? You didn't know he came over? The amount of relief I felt, I cannot tell you. I told Brandon's mother to send John home immediately, that he was in big trouble. They only lived six houses down from us on the same street, but my son was only nine years old. I should have called the police that night, and I will tell you why. My wife got home pretty quick with my daughter. John walked in the door like nothing was wrong. What do you think you're doing leaving the house without my permission? He looked at me like I was insane. Dad, you said I could go. I asked you. I glared at him with an equally puzzled look on my face. When? No, I did not. When you were outside my bedroom door playing. My look of confusion turned into terror. What are you talking about? I fell asleep on my bed. I was never playing outside your door. My son responded. You knocked and I said come in and you giggled. You were playing. I asked if I could go to Brandon's and you said yes. At this point I was a mixture of extreme confusion and fear. John, I've been asleep. I never said you could go there. I was never outside your door playing. My son looked at me very confused. Fast forward a bit now. I had chalked this up to a misunderstanding. My son was either lying to me, or was hearing things, or I had done these things and had no memory of it, because of how tired I was, perhaps? I really didn't know. That night, we were all laying in bed, and I was laying there in the darkness, my wife asleep next to me. We had a back door connected to our master bedroom. The back door had a huge glass window on it almost the full length of the door, and I could see the entire backyard. It was a normal thing for me to look out there periodically throughout the night, because it was right in my line of sight when I would lay on my right side. While laying there, trying to make sense of the earlier incident, I felt the blood in my veins turn from a warm flow to an icy cold current. There was a man crouched down in my backyard underneath my trampoline, seemingly looking into my house. I lay there frozen with fear, probably for about two or three minutes. The man did not move an inch. He had no idea that I could see him. Suddenly, the man forced me to react. He moved very quickly out from under the trampoline and toward my daughter's bedroom window which was just out of my view. Just as quickly as that happened, I heard my daughter scream. No exaggeration. I was out of that bed and in her room in like five seconds. In the midst of her scream, my son opened his door as I flew by, my wife right behind me. I switched on my daughter's light to see her sitting up in bed, screaming, glaring at her bedroom window glaring at the maniac with his palms pressed against her glass, laughing hysterically. I gasped, grabbed my daughter, and all of us ran into the kitchen, where I grabbed the house phone off the wall 
and dropped it due to the speed I had tried to do so. I picked it up off the ground and very shakily dialed 911. The man's laugh had ceased, and none of us moved. My wife and I clutched kitchen knives as the four of us crouched in the dark and waited for the police to arrive. To my surprise, they showed up very quickly and knocked on the front door. I let them in and told them what happened. They walked through the whole house and into the backyard and found nothing. He was gone. After talking with the cops for a while and puzzling all the pieces together, I concluded that the man had been in my house earlier that evening while I slept and played a little game with my son. To this day, I have no idea why this happened, who he was, or where he went. But we never saw him again. He was never located, and he was never caught. I bought a weapon very shortly after this incident. I pray I never see this man around my family again, or I will use it. Last year around this time, I was at a Christmas party at my friend John's house. I didn't really know anyone there, and didn't do much talking. Everyone at the party seemed very nice. About an hour after I arrived, we started playing a game called the White Elephant. It's where you trade gifts among everyone, and everyone has an opportunity to steal a gift from someone else if they like it more than what they have. I had never played it before, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. In the middle of the game, a woman opened an envelope and read a note that was inside. Her face turned red, and she became noticeably very uncomfortable and started looking around and was repeating, This isn't funny. Everyone wanted to know what the note said. She started to read it out loud and then stopped. She couldn't do it. She handed the note to a man, and he read it. His face turned red as well and he seemed uncomfortable too. Now everyone was demanding to know what it said. He gulped, and then read the words. I have killed six people. This is not a joke. The room became quiet and deadly serious. There were gasps, and a couple people said things like, Oh, very funny. It was clear that the joyous mood was shattered. Some people started yelling and demanding to know who wrote it. I eventually asked to see it, and when it was handed to me, I saw that it was typed. People began to argue, and I quickly grabbed my coat from the couch in the other room and told John I was going to take off. He nodded and was trying to calm people down. I walked out the door into the fresh falling snow. I haven't spoken with John too much since then but I did ask him once if he found out who wrote the note, and he said no, that the party broke up shortly after I left. I often wonder if it was really not a joke, and somebody had confessed in a very twisted way to murdering six people. This happened when I was in college, four years ago. I went to a university that was very close to the ocean on the east coast. I made friends with some people one weekend, and one guy in the group of people I met invited us to go out on his boat with him sometime. He described his boat to a bunch of people, and was very proud to have it. It sounded like an expensive sailboat by the way he described it. I'm not really familiar with boats and hadn't ever been on one other than a cruise ship when I was 11. This guy said his parents bought it for him, and that made sense because he was known to be a spoiled rich kid. He was nice though, and the idea of cruising around some Saturday afternoon and drink some beers sounded appealing. After that conversation, I saw him around in school, but didn't talk to him much until one day he approached me in the library and asked if I still wanted to go sailing. I said sure, that sounded awesome, and he told me the following day he was going out on the water 
and it would be a perfect opportunity. After a lengthy conversation about how sailing works, and him assuring me it was safe, and he had all the proper training, I told him I would meet him at the docks the next morning. That night, my roommate asked me what I was doing for the weekend, and I told him that I had made plans to go out sailing. He freaked out on me, and told me he really wished he could go. My roommate and I were really good friends, and honestly, it sounded like way more fun if he was to join us. So I invited him to go, and that I was sure that the other guy would be cool with it. The next morning, my roommate and I grabbed some coffee, and grabbed some beer to bring along with us on our voyage. We ate some breakfast, and then headed over to the docks to meet the guy. We were pretty excited, and when we got there, we followed the direction he gave me, and found his boat. It was a huge orange and white sailboat. We stood on the dock next to the boat looking at it, when the guy popped his head up from somewhere, and immediately showed a look of concern on his face. He jumped off the side of the boat and onto the dock next to us. He looked at my roommate, and then at me, and asked, who is this? I told him he was my roommate, that he was cool, and that he had asked if he could come along. I told him I didn't think he would mind. The guy looked very annoyed, and it was very awkward for a few moments. The guy kept looking back and forth at the boat, and then at us. He took his hat off and rubbed his head like he was really stressed out. Eventually he sighed, and said that it was fine. I'll fast forward now to the part of this story that is very, very scary. A few hours later we were on the boat, drinking and having fun. The water was pretty smooth sailing, and the sun was shining bright on us. The guy acted a bit off the whole time, and I figured it was because I brought my roommate. After drinking three or four more beers, I felt the courage to ask the guy what was wrong, and if he was still upset that I brought my roommate. He responded with something along the lines of, It just kind of ruined my plans. My roommate chimed in with a smile on his face and asked the guy, What plans? I could tell my roommate thought it was funny because it sounded like the guy wanted to be alone with me. The guy looked at him and said, Well, because you're here, I can't kill him. This took me off guard completely, and I felt fear an unbelievable relief hit me at the same time. My roommate and this guy started cracking up, and my roommate brushed it off as a joke completely. I didn't know what to think. Was this guy serious? Did I avoid being killed by him? Is his sense of humor just that weird? I believe I got my answer when I went below the deck an hour later to grab another beer from the fridge. Next to his fridge was a brown swinging door that led to a small private bedroom quarters. I was feeling the beer pretty good by this point, and without thinking, I pushed the door open. Lying at the foot of the bed that was in there was a big cinder block, some yellow rope, tape, and what looked like a recorder of some sort. After seeing that, I felt sick to my stomach and wanted off the boat as soon as possible. I wanted to go back up and confront the guy, but decided against it, because of what he might have been capable of. What seemed like hours and hours more being with this guy, we finally made it back to the dock. We said our goodbyes, and on the way back to my room, I told my roommate about what I saw. He couldn't believe it. I am pretty sure that my roommate saved my life that day, by wanting to go with me. Not joking. I never saw that guy again on campus. What he had planned, I don't want to know, or even think about it. I have a story I'd like to tell you all. This happened when I was 18, about 16 years ago. I was still living with my parents in their nice house in suburban Colorado. It was getting late one night, around 11.30 p.m. I was on the phone with my girlfriend and had decided to go up to my room and switch phones, using the one that was in my room, so that I didn't wake my parents that I now assumed were in bed. Voices downstairs echoed upstairs easily, and I had gotten in trouble for that a few times before. I told my girlfriend to hang on, 
that I was going to put the phone down for a minute while I went upstairs to turn on my phone. I set the phone down on the counter, right next to where it gets hung up on the wall. I quickly walked upstairs and into my bedroom. My room was cold. I left the window open. I slammed my window shut and picked up the phone next to my bed. All right, babe, one sec. I'm going to go downstairs real fast and hang up the living room phone. I set the phone down on my bed and went downstairs. I reached the last step, turned left, and stopped. The phone was now hung up on the wall. I stood there bewildered for about 30 seconds, a bit creeped out, but mostly confused. Maybe my parents came down and hung it up? No, that wasn't possible. I would have heard them, and I was only upstairs for about 30 seconds. I walked over to the phone and then turned around looking around the living room and into the kitchen. Nothing. No sign of my parents. Nobody else was in my house that night. I convinced myself that I must have hung it up before I went upstairs. Wait. No, that's not possible. Then I would have hung up on my girlfriend. I walked into the dining room and nobody was there. I walked back upstairs and over to my parents' bedroom. I pressed my ear to the door and could hear my dad snoring. What is going on? I walked into my bedroom and almost had a heart attack when I saw that my bedroom phone was now hung up. I turned around fast to the dark hallway. Nobody. I ran downstairs and to my horror, I saw the phone in the living room was now gone. I got goosebumps all over and my heart was now pounding in my chest. I ran back upstairs and into my room. I ripped open my closet, but nobody was there. I walked over to my phone and picked it up. As soon as I did this, I heard somebody say, I came in through your bedroom window. I almost dropped the phone out of fright and thought, that's impossible. My bedroom is on the second story. I turned around again expecting to see someone, but did not. I turned and opened my window. I looked outside and saw a large extension ladder there, leaning on my house, just below the bottom of my window. I dropped the phone on the ground and ran to my parents' room. I slammed against their door with fists and yelled, Open the door, there's somebody in the house! My mom opened up and was confused, with a terrified look on her face. I went into their room and my dad was sitting up in bed. I locked their bedroom door and repeated myself, there is someone in here. They have the phone. They just said something to me. My mom ran to my dad's side of the bed and grabbed his work cell phone that was still in his jeans pocket. She called the police, and they were at our front door knocking around 15 minutes later. They searched the house and found no one. They did find the living room phone, though. It was lying in the middle of the grass in our backyard. A few winters ago, I got a job as a security guard. My responsibilities were to guard the construction site of a three-story industrial building that was still in development. This was a super sweet job. All I had to do was be at the construction site between hours of 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. I could sit in my truck the entire time, except for two different times I was instructed to patrol the site. What I would do is get out of my truck and walk the perimeter of the site, and then go inside and shine my flashlight around. This obviously wasn't a hard task, but it was a bit creepy. It was pitch black around this site at night, and there were no working lights anywhere. Every time I patrolled, I was a bit creeped out. Except for one evening, where the creepiness turned into straight-up terror. The night was going by normally, I was watching YouTube videos and listening to music in my truck. The clock hit 1 a.m., and I was due to complete my second patrol through the site. The first patrol went by completely normal, and I had no reason to expect any different this time around. So I jumped out of the truck and started down the path that led around the site. I was shining my flashlight in front of me the whole time, 
and saw nothing out of the ordinary. This trek around the site took the most time out of the patrol, and I'd say about 15 minutes after I began, I had circled all the way around and was back at my truck. At this time, I headed inside the building. My truck was parked in the front of the building, and so I entered at the front door. This building was still being framed, and there were no doors installed anywhere, including the ones that led to the exterior. And that's the reason I was here, to make sure nobody just walked inside and stole any construction equipment, or vandalized any part of it. As I walked inside, I heard something upstairs. It sounded like a shovel or something had fallen onto the floor, and so I hesitantly started up the stairs to investigate. This was the first time that anything like this happened. As I walked up the stairs, shining my flashlight in front of me, I was spooked. What would I do if there was somebody up here messing around? I didn't have a weapon or anything. I reached the top of the stairs and the second floor. I shined my flashlight around and didn't see anything suspicious. I walked around and eventually reached the front of the building. And that's when I looked down to my truck through the recently installed window there. There was somebody sitting in my truck. I noticed quickly that it was a man with a shaved head. He was sitting in the driver's side seat with his legs still hanging out of the truck facing me. The man had his arms crossed and he was wearing all black. I was just about to turn around and head back down to confront him when he suddenly looked up at me and waved. At that moment, I turned around and ran back to the stairs. I walked down them quickly and ran out of the building. I approached my truck, and the guy was no longer there. I got very nervous at this point and looked around with my flashlight. I saw nothing and decided to call my boss and let him know that there was somebody here. As the phone was ringing, I searched my truck and saw that nothing was missing and everything was right where I left it. My boss did not answer, and so I left a very short message stating, Uh, uh it's 1.22 a.m. and there is someone messing around at the site. Have not located them yet. I shined my light around like a madman searching for this potentially dangerous person and thought that it would be a better idea to get in my truck and drive slowly around the site. This did not take long, and I did not see anyone. I circled back to the front and parked my truck in the same exact spot I was in before. I put the truck in park and called my boss again. I got no answer once again and got out of the truck. I stood next to my driver's side door and again shined my light around. I didn't see anybody. Then I shined the light up to the window I'd first noticed him at and saw him standing in the same spot I was in, now looking down at me. I realized my job was to stop people from messing around at this site, but this creeped me out so much that I got in my truck and just waited until my boss eventually called back. He called the police, I guess, because an officer showed up there about a half an hour later. He went inside the building and looked around, but never found the guy. I didn't see him again that night, or any other night I was there. I have no idea why he was there. When I was 24 years old, I experienced something so strange, so scary, that I just had to write about it and share it with the world. It is absolutely true and was the scariest thing that has ever happened in my life. I was traveling at the time, going to visit my best friend who had moved a few states away from me to go to college. One day, I was driving in Ohio if I remember correctly. I was on a long highway that stretched across the state, when out of nowhere, my car died. I shifted to the side of the road, where I eventually came to a stop. I didn't run out of gas. I had just filled up at the last town. 
I tried starting my car, and I was very happy when it actually started. I was confused, and was worried about why it just died on me. As I started to pick up speed and get back on track, my car started making weird noises, and it sounded like something was grinding on something else. I looked up and saw a sign that showed that there was a gas station and food at the next exit. My car was moving, but with this grinding noise, I decided to get off the highway and take a look at it at the gas station. There were only two places off this exit that I could see. A gas station with one pump and an old-looking diner not too far off next to it. I pulled into the gas station and it looked closed. I checked my watch and quickly realized this was very strange as it was only 2.30 p.m. What kind of gas station closes before this time, I wondered. I got out of my car and approached the glass door entrance to the station. I put my hands up and cupped the glass around my eyes to look inside. The place looked abandoned. It was obvious nobody was there, and I turned and looked around me. I felt a bit uneasy at this moment, when I saw that there were no other people or cars around me. Where am I? I checked my phone, and of course, I had no service. I looked up at the sky, and it was white. The clouds were moving fiercely, and it was extremely cold outside. I decided to get back in my car and drive over to the diner. When I reached this place, I thought for sure it was closed as well. But to my surprise, before I could even reach the door after getting out of my car, an older woman opened the door to the place and greeted me with a smile. She looked nice, and I was so relieved to see somebody else and maybe get some hot food in my stomach. She just said hello and asked if it was just me. Did I want a booth? Blah, blah, blah. I told her yes, it was only me, and a booth sounded fine. This diner looked very old-fashioned, and there was no other customers inside. The woman showed me to my seat, and I scooted into the booth. I looked up at her. She was wearing an old apron with stains all over it. Her teeth were old, yellow, and cracked. She had a pleasant voice, though, and seemed to be a very nice person. She handed me a menu and asked what I would like to drink. I told her a Coke or a Pepsi would be fine, and she smiled and said she would be right back. I sat there looking at this menu, and I noticed that there was actually dirt on it. It looked like it had been sitting outside for years. I cleaned it off, and the food on it that was available was very basic. Burger, chicken sandwich, fries, salads. That was pretty much it. I decided to order a burger with some fries. A few minutes passed, and she hadn't returned with my drink yet. I was anxious to ask her if there was a mechanic around there to look at my car. A few more minutes passed, and I started thinking, what is going on back there? I yelled out, uh, hello, in as nice a voice as possible. No response. At this point, I was annoyed and got up. I walked over to the door that led into the back cooking area and swung it open, about to ask where my drink was. The back of the diner was empty. There were no cooks, no fryers, no grills, nothing. The woman was nowhere in sight. It was obvious to me at that moment. This diner was not a running establishment, and I felt sick to my stomach. I started to walk into the back area when I heard the scariest, most evil old lady laugh I have ever heard. I stopped and backed up out of the door into the front area. I turned and walked out the door I came in from. I ran down the three steps and over to my car and got inside. Thankfully, my car started and I floored it out of there. As I was driving away, I looked into my rear view mirror and saw the woman standing in the middle of the road.
I recently moved into a big house, just temporarily. It's kind of a complicated situation. The house belongs to a family member. They were going to be gone for a few months, that sort of thing. I was going to be there on my own, so obviously I thought, what if this place is haunted? There wasn't anything in the house when I moved in, but there is now. I was in the main hallway unpacking some stuff when the doorbell rang. That put me on edge right away, because the house is at the end of a long driveway and kind of out of the way. You have to go looking for it. There was an old woman at the door, or sort of old. It was kind of hard to tell. This was in broad daylight, but there was still something kind of off about her. She was really tall, like a full head taller than me, and there was something weird about the way she looked. It was like none of her clothes fit her properly. She shook my hand and smiled, really wide, and told me that she was from the neighborhood council or something, and asked if she could come in and talk to me. My gut reaction was to say no, but I couldn't really think of a reason to. She was just an old woman. What was she going to do? I really wish I had just slammed the door in her face. I brought her into the living room, and she sort of tottered behind me, like her feet didn't fit into her shoes properly. She sat down without asking, and grinned at me until I took a seat across from her. For about half a minute, she didn't say anything, just smiled and stared at me while it got increasingly awkward. Just as I was about to break the silence, she fished into her pocket and pulled out this really big old-fashioned candy, the type that comes in see-through wrapping. Here, she said, eat this. I should probably point out here that she spoke really quietly, so it was difficult to hear anything she said. I accepted the candy, kind of taken aback, and unwrapped it. It was dark red, almost black. I popped it into my mouth, because she was still grinning at me and nodding her head. Have you ever walked around behind a supermarket where they keep those big bins? They throw meat that's gone bad in those bins. Imagine that rancid smell, but on a hot summer day. It's so thick, you can almost feel it in the air. That is what this candy tasted like. I almost spit it out onto the floor, but social niceties made me chew the thing and force it down my throat. The woman was talking the whole time, but between the taste in her quiet voice, I barely heard her. My mouth tasted like rotten meat, so I politely told her I was going to get some water and walked fast into the kitchen. When I came back, she was gone. I had been in the kitchen for less than 30 seconds. My first reaction probably should have been to assume that she went to the bathroom or had to leave in a hurry. Instead, I searched the entire house. I went through every single room, convinced I was going to open a closet or look under a bed and see her stuffed in there grinning at me. That didn't happen, obviously, but I was still extremely on edge as the sun started to go down. I felt like I was turning off the light in my bedroom after spotting a giant spider in there. That night, I propped a chair against my bedroom door because I just couldn't shake the feeling that the woman was still in the house somewhere, hiding. I woke up at around 2.30 in the morning and heard creaking floorboards downstairs. It was an old house and unfamiliar. I kept telling myself that until the noises stopped. When I woke up the next morning, there was a red candy on the living room table. I'll tell you the same thing I told the police. No, I couldn't be absolutely certain that the candy wasn't there the day before. Maybe I had just overlooked it, but I didn't think so. 
They told me that the organization the woman claimed to come from did not actually exist and clearly thought I was wasting their time. After they left, I searched the entire house again and the grounds. Then, I searched them again. By the time I was finished, I had managed to calm down a bit and looked at the situation rationally. The woman probably left the candy there the previous day, and I just didn't notice. I had searched the whole house twice now. There was nowhere she could possibly be hiding. She was probably just some doddery old lady who wandered off while I was in the kitchen. As I prepared to go to bed, I had managed to fully delude myself into thinking nothing strange was going on. I decided not to do anything childish like blocking my door. Because what was I afraid of? Even if she somehow was still inside the house somewhere, what was she going to do? At some point in the middle of the night, I woke up abruptly, knowing in the back of my mind that something was wrong. I guess I must have heard something in my sleep. I turned over onto my side and reached out to turn on the bedside lamp, groping around because I was in an unfamiliar room. When the light came on, I saw the old woman standing right next to my bed. I only got the briefest glimpse of her before she vanished into the unlit hallway outside my door. I now believe that the human brain has a special compartment for dealing with experiences far outside the realm of the natural. If I had woken up to find a burglar in my room, I probably would have gone numb with panic. If there was a lion at the foot of my bed, I would have been too paralyzed with fear to do anything. But as soon as the woman, the woman, was gone, that special compartment took over. I jumped out of bed and slammed the door shut, and then shoved a chair up against the handle. Then I dashed for my phone. No signal. No internet. I later found out there was nothing wrong with the phone or the local service. I think she was interfering with it somehow. The drop from the bedroom window wasn't too high. If I landed just right, I would probably avoid injury. But what if I sprained my ankle or broke my leg? I had a sudden vision of pulling myself across the dark garden while the woman sprinted after me and decided I didn't want to risk it. That gave me two options. Wait out the night in my bedroom or try to get out of the house now. I went for the second option. I had a thought that my flimsy barricade would not hold if the woman decided she wanted back in. I broke one of the chair legs off and crept slowly into the hallway, reaching carefully for the light switch. When I pressed it, the lights came on for a second and then faded out. I flicked the switch a few more times. Nothing. Some gut instinct told me she was sabotaging them somehow. I used my phone for light as I slowly, quietly crept along the upstairs hallway and down the stairs. The light barely traced the shapes of the walls and the dark, yawning frames of open doorways. I jumped at every single shadow and unidentifiable shape, certain that any second that grinning face would appear out of the shadows. I got downstairs into the front door. I had double locked it and put the chain in place. Just as I was reaching for the first lock, I heard rapid, uneven footsteps at the top of the stairs, approaching swiftly. I undid the first lock. A high-pitched shriek came from the hallway down the stairs, and I screamed as I undid the second lock and wrenched the door open. It stuck fast. I had forgotten the chain. I glanced behind me and saw the tall, spindly shape of the woman half running, half falling down the stairs toward me, her head lolling backward, and her mouth hanging open. I can't even remember getting the chain off. I might actually have just yanked the door open so hard that it broke. In any case, the last I saw of the woman was her face, inches away from me, as I slammed the door shut. I sprinted to the nearest house, and they called the police. 
possibly because I was half delirious with fear and babbling incoherently. The police once again failed to find anything unusual. It's been a week. I'm staying at a friend's place, sleeping with the lights on and the bedroom door barricaded. The house's real owners aren't back yet. I'm not sure what I'm going to tell them, but I have to stop them from going back there. Somehow. This isn't a haunting. It's an infestation. I can't stop thinking about all the holes in our defenses. The windows and doors left open. The strangers invited into our living rooms. I just hope it's the house that she wanted and not me. It was Christmas time. I was 14 years old. My family and I were going ice skating one evening. My family consisted of my two younger brothers my mom, and my stepfather. I had invited my girlfriend to come with us, and we were just waiting on her to show up at our house so that we could leave. She eventually made it over, and we all piled into an SUV and headed downtown. The ice skating rink was packed, as it was only open at Christmas time, and it was 8 o'clock on a Saturday. After driving around the rink a few times, we found a parking spot. We all started walking over to it, and as we walked... I saw that all of the lights went off in the skating rink, and for about one minute, green and red black lights were lighting the whole place up. It was pretty cool, I thought, and I was looking forward to getting my skates on. They were serving hot cocoa right next door, in a little booth. My little brothers wanted some, and so my parents jumped in line, while my girlfriend and I headed to the window where we could rent some ice skates. There was no line there, and we got our skates pretty quickly. We sat down on the bench near the window and put on our skates. My girlfriend had never been ice skating before, and she was a bit nervous. She was afraid she would fall, but I told her it's really not that difficult, and even if she did, it's not a big deal. We got to our feet with our skates now on and walked over to the skating rink. Before we stepped onto it, suddenly the lights switched to the dark green and red lights again. You could barely see when the lights switched and people were running into each other all over the place. Some people were falling down. It was a cool idea to have the lights switch to green and red for the holiday, but whoever set the lights up made them way too dim. My girlfriend told me to wait for the lights to switch back on, and we did. A minute later, the normal lights popped back on, and we stepped onto the ice. My girlfriend skated awkwardly for a few minutes, but got the hang of it fairly quickly and we were soon flying around the rink. After about six laps, the lights went out again, but this time, it seemed to me that it was even darker than before. My girlfriend grabbed my arm and clung to me as we tried not to run into anyone. As we skated in the near darkness now, she asked me, It's getting darker, don't you think? I agreed, and the lights popped back on again. We sighed with relief and continued skating. As we made our way around, we passed a man wearing a dark red trench coat that was about to step onto the ice. He had a dark red hood over his head, which covered most of his face. After noticing him, I looked around for my family and spotted them sitting down on the benches, drinking their hot cocoa. I looked over to my girlfriend who had broken away from my arm, and she looked nervous. I skated closer to her, and asked her if she wanted to get off the ice. She said no, but that she was worried about when the lights flipped to the dark green and red again. She was worried that they would flip off completely and leave everyone in complete darkness. As if on cue, the lights switched off. And they switched off completely. My girlfriend gasped along with many other people around us. For the briefest of moments, everyone was quiet and it was pitch black. It was an incredibly eerie feeling, being on the ice with so many people, but feeling alone. 
Then suddenly, I heard a woman scream. Then I heard commotion. The woman's screams were silenced, and then I heard a man yell in a similar way, like they had just been really hurt by something. My girlfriend and I ran into a group of people, and we all collapsed onto the ice. She started calling my name, and I could hear the fear in her voice. People were falling all around us, and then I heard another woman scream. This scream was piercing, and I knew at that moment that something was very wrong. The woman continued to scream when I heard somebody else scream bloody murder. At this point, I could hear noises of frantic people falling, moving and screaming, trying to escape the ice rink. I tried to stand up, but was hit by people in all directions, and my hands were sliding across the ice as I crawled. It felt like razor blades. I was hyperventilating, when suddenly I felt an extreme pain in the tip of my middle finger on my right hand. I realized that somebody had just skated over it. I stopped crawling and heard yet another ear-piercing scream of agony and terror. I started calling my girlfriend's name, but did not get a response. Somebody skated into me, their knee hitting my face hard. I fell flat onto the ice, and my breath was taken away when I felt random people topple on top of me. One person landing on my stomach. As they all tried to separate from each other and myself, I felt an ice skate slice my thigh. I started crawling again fast, and I could feel my finger pulsating as blood gushed from the wound. I hit a wall, and I remember feeling the tiniest relief. I called my girlfriend's name again, but once again, no response in the midst of screams and frantic mayhem. It sounded as if everyone was screaming now, and I thought that I might have a heart attack. I stuck to the side of the wall and attempted to stand up onto my skates again. I reached my feet and started coughing. I felt somebody clip my back as they skated by me. And then suddenly I felt pain. Pain in my back. Monumental pain. The worst pain I have ever felt. At first, I thought somebody had somehow cut my back with an ice skate, but I twisted my arm and reached around to my back to feel what it was. Somebody then crashed into me and I fell onto the ice once more. Tears poured from my eyes and screams erupted from all around me. I twisted my arm to reach my back again, and I felt it. Somebody had stabbed me. My breathing started to get heavy, and a full breath was difficult to achieve. The pain was growing more intense, and I felt panic set in, as it felt like the pain would not reach a stopping point, and would just increase and increase. Suddenly, I heard another scream very close. It was mine. My screams joined the rest, and I began sobbing in between screams. I started crawling once more, but I couldn't move as I did before. My muscles were becoming weaker, and I felt as if I were falling asleep. I moved slowly, and I could feel thick syrupy liquid wherever I put my hands on the ice. It was warm. I knew it was blood. My blood. And I suddenly began coughing again, with no control, and didn't stop. I put my hand over my mouth and stopped crawling. I felt blood coming out of my throat as I coughed, and it started to block my nasal passage, and I could barely breathe. The screams were absolutely ear-shattering at this point. I lay on my back and started to shiver. After a few minutes, I felt people fall and trip over me once again, and I flipped over onto my stomach. After this, I looked up and I could see small beams of light all over the place. And then, I heard people speak. It was the police, I thought to myself. They were running and tripping over people, trying to get people out. Trying to help. I put my arm up and said the word. Help. But nothing came out. I couldn't say it. I dropped my arm back to the ice, and I felt my eyes start to close. I cleared my throat, full of blood, and coughed it onto the ice. Everything at that moment went black. 
I awoke in a hospital bed. 24 people were murdered on the ice skating rink that night. My girlfriend included. On November the 10th, 2014, YouTuber Kenny Veach set off on his last hike. He had informed some close relatives that he was going on a short overnight trip into the desert near Area 51, but it was one from which he would never return. Yet Kenny was hardly an inexperienced desert hiker or spelunker. He had ventured into the arid, dry deserts of Nevada many times before, he claimed to have hiked solo across mountaintops that many people would have never dared to attempt and had lost count of the number of caves he had explored. But there was one particular cave that had terrified the veteran explorer, and it was during an additional visit to that particular subterranean cavern that he disappeared without a trace. Kenny was no amateur. He had been hiking and caving for 20 plus years having encountered all sorts of life-threatening dangers on his travels, from sheer cliffs and animal traps to rattlesnakes and freezing conditions. Kenny had faced some of the most terrifying threats the natural world has to offer, but he always made it back. He always got himself out of whatever jam he was in. He might have returned beat up and exhausted from his trips, but only once was he ever forced to call for help in an incident in which he had hurt his leg on a mountaintop and was forced to call a helicopter rescue. So it was well documented that he had an excellent safety record and was in no way reckless or foolish. One day, while Kenny was out exploring the desert near Nellis Air Force Base, he came across a cave system with an entrance shaped like a perfect capital M. Kenny entered every cave he came across, and naturally, he was even more curious about this one, given its unusual shape. But on his approach, he found a strange feeling taking over his body, a bizarre vibrating feeling that shook him to his bones. The closer he got to the cave's entrance, the more intense the feeling became, until it was so strong that he became intensely terrified, fleeing the area without even attempting to explore it. He posted a YouTube video under the username Snakebite McGee, which was titled Son of an Area 51 Technician. This video detailing the events, telling his viewers that it was by far the strangest experience he had ever had whilst out hiking in the desert. And so began one of Nevada's most peculiar and puzzling urban legends. Obviously, the video sparked a huge amount of interest from his subscribers. A multitude of users enthusiastically encouraged Kenny to return to the cave to properly explore it, and to properly document its appearance and location as to provide proper evidence of his strange and terrifying discovery. Naturally, he obliged them. On this second trip to the M-shaped cave, Kenny armed himself with a 9mm along with a video camera so that he might show his subscribers exactly what he had seen. However, much to the disappointment and skepticism of the YouTube community, Kenny couldn't seem to be able to retrace his steps to the cave's location. Some called him out as having lied about what he had seen, calling him a fraud and a fabricator. However, in the video itself, Kenny is visibly shaken that he can't seem to locate what he'd easily stumbled across during his previous visit. His experience with hiking and navigation meant that he'd have no trouble finding it again if he wished to do so, and we can understand why people might think that made him a liar. But Kenny insisted that it was like his mind was playing tricks on him, and rebuked any who accused him of having made the story up. To save face, Kenny vowed to go back out into the desert a third time, in order to prove that he was not simply lying about the whole thing. This seemed to satisfy the doubters and reassure his regular viewers. All except one. No, do not go back there. 
If you find that cave entrance, don't go in. You will never come out. Read one user's comment on the video posted. Other commenters asked them exactly what they meant by the plea, imploring them to share what knowledge they had of the cave that would cause them to leave such a stark warning. The user never replied. Even in spite of the warning, Kenny was undeterred. He was determined to prove that he was not a liar, determined to prove that his hiking and navigating skills weren't slipping. At some point, he posted a comment telling his viewers that he was making a third trip into the Mojave, one of the hottest and driest regions of the planet, in order to finally relocate the cave and to explore it. He told viewers that, although he was not taking his video camera for mobility's sake, he would be making a detailed record of the cave's location so that he and his subscribers could easily find the MK for themselves for the sake of making their own judgments. Viewers awaited his return with bated breath, thrilled at the prospect of more information on a place that could well be connected with nearby Area 51, or at least have some kind of extraterrestrial or paranormal significance. Since Kenny would be making an overnight trip, they knew they would have to wait until the following day for a new post from their favorite desert explorer. But the day came, and nothing was posted. Then another day went by, and still nothing was posted on Kenny's YouTube channel regarding the M Cave. Eventually, concerned viewers alerted local authorities that Kenny might well be in some danger, and after the mandatory 72-hour period, Kenny Veach was officially listed as a missing person, and the search for him began. On the 22nd of November 2014, search and rescue volunteers found Kenny's cell phone lying in the dirt at the entrance to an abandoned mine shaft. This was the same mine shaft featured during the video entitled M Cave Hike. Kenny's second trip into the desert, in which he filmed himself being unable to locate the cave entrance, much to his own anxious confusion. The search and rescue volunteers superficially explored the bottom of the shaft, but could not find Kenny or his body. Yet there was no other trail leading from the cave that would indicate that Kenny had headed off in any other direction. To the volunteers, it seemed like he had just straight up disappeared plucked from the face of the earth by some unknown, unseen force. Additional rescue teams were called in from surrounding areas, and on the advice of Kenny's girlfriend and sometime hiking partner, they found his truck in its unusual parking spot. But again, Kenny was nowhere to be found, and any trails they found went cold near the abandoned mine shaft. Kenny's sudden disappearance fueled all manner of conspiracy theories, which speculated on his fate. Some insisted that Kenny had fallen down the mine shaft, even in spite of the search and rescue team's insistence that there was no corpses to be found down there. Others asserted that Kenny had found a hidden entrance to Area 51, or had come across some kind of military secret that had led him to being detained by the U.S. military. While more outlandish theories abounded that the M Cave was some kind of extraterrestrial structure and that Kenny had either been abducted or killed by visitors from other worlds. It is most likely that Kenny simply fell victim to the elements, went a bridge too far in his search for the truth, and had died of dehydration or heat stroke. But if this was the case, there is very little doubt that his body would not be found and recovered by the search and rescue teams, who at one point used a helicopter to scour the area for any signs of him. But a post from Kenny's girlfriend in the months that followed his disappearance might shed a little more light on what became of him. She mentioned that her boyfriend had been battling with depression for many years by that point, and that he may well have gone out into the desert one last time to end his own life. At least, that's the only logical explanation she could think of. Yet, as much as we can rely on her for an insight into his personality, it ties into our previous point, that surely someone somewhere would have found his body. We might never learn the truth of Kenny Veach's fate, 
but if we can learn anything from his disappearance, it's that it would be extremely unwise to go looking for that M-shaped cave. During my teenage years, my family and I lived in military housing here in the U.S. A few doors down, there was a new couple with two kids who were referred to me since I made a little weekend cash working as a babysitter for some families who lived in base housing. Their house was pretty bare and undecorated since they had only been moved in there for like a week or so. When I arrived, the mom was showing me around the house with a three-month-old baby in her arms showing me where the baby's formula was kept, where I could get myself a bite to eat, stuff like that. I had to admit that I was a little worried about that particular job. Three months old was by far the youngest baby I had ever sat for, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't think that the mom was having similar thoughts. However, they were only going to go to their welcoming event for a couple of hours, and it was right there on the base though, so not very far at all. I mean, what could possibly go wrong in such a short space of time? Well, something did go wrong, and it occurred at the very top of the staircase, as her three-year-old called her, and she was following me down. A strap on the mom's flip-flop snapped off, and she suffered a terrible fall, completely taking me out as she toppled hopelessly down to the bottom, and as she did, she ended up dropping the baby from her arms. Honestly, I'm not sure how it happened, as I am not exactly famous amongst friends for my agility. Quite the opposite, in fact. But as I was being sacked, I reached up and just sort of snatched the baby out of the air, grabbing a hold of her onesie and holding her up high as we hurtled to the bottom. I ended up with a black eye and some serious bruises, where the mom essentially bowled me over. But, thankfully, whenever I think about this, the baby was luckily completely unscathed. Whereas the mom, she ended up with an open fracture of one leg right above her knee and a pretty solid concussion. I mean, the wounds looked horrendous. She was bleeding all over that new cream carpet. But she did not act as if anything hurt at all, though. She just kept on saying... Thank you. You saved my baby. You saved my baby. Over and over again. As the kid's dad called 911 and rushed an ambulance crew over to the house. They ended up paying me like $200 for a four-hour gig that night, which in 1987 was practically a king's ransom, especially to a teenager like me. But I don't think my pulse slowed down for a week. I'm serious about that. Sometimes I'd think about catching that baby out of the air, and I'd feel like I was going to have a panic attack. I pretty much stopped babysitting shortly after that, because that freaked me out so much. Not just the event, but word getting around like I was some superhero with cat-like reflexes, when I'm pretty sure if that happened again, I could not grab that baby if I tried. I know that sounds crazy, that I probably just should have soaked up the praise and used it to make a ton more money, but it was all just way too much pressure for a young person like me. My grandparents had passed away within a few months of each other leaving their house empty. There was talk of renting it out initially, but because of its poor state of disrepair, the family decided against it. No consensus about what to do with it could be arrived at. Therefore, it would be left to decay for another decade or more before I would stumble upon it. My aunt and I were going through my mother's things and discovered an old family photo album. Mom had gone off on one of her journeys and no one was sure if she would ever return. Her and I had been having an on-and-off relationship for years, so there was a lot about this family I didn't know. I came across a picture of her and I, 
when I was just a baby, but I didn't recognize the house we were standing in front of. I inquired, and my aunt told me about the old Wheeler family house that had once belonged to her parents. No one had been there in over a decade, and she wasn't even sure if it was still standing. So, after half an hour of badgering, she agreed to take me out to see it. That following morning, we headed out of town, through 30 miles of cornfields, until we came to a turnoff that led down a long, weedy gravel road. As we crested the hill, I was taken aback. The house I saw before me, despite being run down, was still breathtaking. In its prime, it must have been the finest home in the county. My aunt pulled up within a few yards of it, and we got out. From what I could see, nobody but the occasional mowing company had been there in a very long time. I couldn't help but be in awe of the place. The vibrant pink and blue paint had long faded from its soaring towers, and the massive porch was beginning to sag in a few places. Before I entered, I wanted to take in every bit of the wonderful facade as I could. Around the back was the remnants of the old horseshoe pit and what I was told, my grandfather's Ford pickup. Although the big house had long seen its best days, I knew that I hadn't seen anything that could have compared. Maybe one of those beautiful Victorian mansions in San Francisco. Even those would be dwarfed in comparison to this. When I was ready, we climbed the concrete steps and entered through the back entrance. From the moment we cracked the door, we were overwhelmed by a hideous smell coming from inside. We assumed it was a normal part of having a house sealed for so long and continued with our search. Everything appeared as if it had been left where it was on my grandmother's last day, almost like a time capsule or museum. The lights were even still working. Only later did I discover that my mother had been paying the bills all these years in hopes someone would return and live there someday. Walking from room to room and seeing all the beautiful antique furnishings, I couldn't stop wondering why I had never been told about the house. Regardless of our frequent estrangements, I would have helped my mother with the upkeep of it. It was downright insane to me to leave such a beautiful place to rot. Then again, my mother's strange ways were the main reason for our frequent falling outs. As we made our way to the second floor, the smell only got worse. I suggested we cut our visit short and just take a quick look around. Every door was closed, so I went for the closest one and stuck my head in. This must have been a guest room or spare. Upon the bed laid a beautiful and elaborate quilt easily over 100 years old. My aunt was going through a cedar chest in a room next to me. I joined her, and we discovered another much older photo album, and decided to bring it back with us to look at later. She closed the door behind us, and I made my way toward the last room. Unfortunately, the closer I got to the door, the stronger the smell got. I was reluctant to open it, but I thought if the poor critter was where I could get to it, I'd take it outside and give it a good burial. Cracking the door, the stench slapped me in the face, and I lost focus for a moment. When I regained my composure, I was met with a terrible sight. Before me was not a dead forest creature, but a human being. The bloated body, now unrecognizable, laid curled up, silently on the bed. I could feel my knees begin to buckle, so I turned as quickly as possible away and out of the room. My aunt was confused by my behavior and stuck her head in before yanking it out, quickly, again. We both ran down the stairs where the smell was less potent, and I called 911. The officer spent a few minutes in the room before coming back out with a small piece of paper and a driver's license. One of them joined us at the table where we were sitting and asked a few questions about my mother. This made me nervous, and I began demanding he explain himself. A serious look came across his face, and he told us, 
that the body appeared to belong to my mother. I didn't want to believe it at first, but when he handed me her license, I knew it was true. My aunt and I held each other for a long time and cried. The officer gave us a few moments before interjecting himself again. Then he asked me if I knew why she would take her own life. I had naturally assumed mom had died in her sleep. She was an older woman, but the note he handed me made everything clear. She had been depressed for a long time because of our being at odds with each other, and the last time we spoke, some things were said she feared she couldn't take back. The morning after our argument, she decided to return to the only place she'd ever been happy, quote-unquote, although she claimed to not be sure of what she was going to do at the time. The poor state of the house just sent her over the edge. The last sentence asked that I not blame myself for her death and that I move on with my life. The ending read simply, Goodbye, Mom. A couple of weeks later, after everyone had time to deal with their grief, I brought the remaining family members together. After seeing the old house and realizing the poor condition of it hurt my mother, I proposed we try to raise the money to renovate it. In light of what had just occurred, I wanted to at least try to create something positive from our tragedy. I was given their blessings and went to work. It took some time, but on the first day of spring 2018, the Historical Society allowed me to lead the first tour of the newly restored Wheeler Mansion. A great day could have been much better had my mother been there with me. No matter our differences, it was her who inspired me and the one who truly made it all possible. The most deadly shark attack in recorded history began on July 30th, 1945. The USS Indianapolis, a Portland-class heavy cruiser of the United States Navy, was taking part in a top-secret mission of the utmost importance. It was tasked with carrying enriched uranium to the island of Tinian in the South Pacific, along with other parts required for the assembly of the world's first deployable atomic bomb. As history shows, the crew of the Indianapolis were successful in their mission, completing the delivery in record speeds that are unbroken even by modern naval vessels. However, as they sailed back towards late for training before the invasion of Okinawa, tragedy struck. Just after midnight on July 30th, the Indianapolis was spotted by a Japanese submarine. Without any escorts to defend her, the Indianapolis was a prime target and the Japanese closed in for the kill. The Indianapolis did not have sonar to detect submarines. They were completely unaware of the danger in which they found themselves. At exactly 015 AM, two Type 95 torpedoes smashed into the right-hand side of the vessel, instantly killing dozens of American sailors and causing obscene amounts of damage to the ship's structure. It took just 12 minutes of panic and terror for the ship to sink completely, taking down over 300 of the crew along with her. The surviving crew members, lacking life jackets and lifeboats, were set adrift among the waves in almost complete darkness. Many thought the worst was over, but their nightmare had only just begun. Naturally, the sailors floating among the debris were expecting to be rescued in a matter of hours, days at most. But the horrible fact was that no one was coming to their rescue. Despite sending several emergency signals before the ship went down, the Navy had somehow lost track of the Indianapolis. Nothing was made of the fact that the ship failed to arrive at late, and many of the emergency messages that were received by nearby ships and naval bases were completely ignored. Declassified records later showed at one such commander in the Philippines was drunk and had told his staff not to disturb him. Another wrongly assumed the SOS calls were some kind of Japanese trap. 
the roughly 900 men who had actually survived the torpedo attack were now exposed to a new, perhaps even deadlier danger. It was dawn when the survivors saw the first sharks in the waters around them. The pure carnage and chaos of the sinking had attracted hundreds of the oceanic white tip and tiger sharks from miles around. Some were apparently as large as 15 feet. It must have been absolutely terrifying for the survivors, seeing huge dorsal fins emerging from the water as the predators began to surround them, circling, picking out the weakest links, those too weak to struggle. At first, the sharks focused on the dead bodies floating in the water. Many men had died from exposure, salt poisoning, or thirst, and it was these corpses that provided the easiest meals for the circling sharks. But soon, the lifeless bodies among the survivors had been completely devoured by the hungry predators. It wasn't long before they turned their attention toward the living. The survivors later reported that they were losing at least three or four men to the sharks every single day. At some points, they counted 20 to 30 sharks in the water, their dorsal fins breaking the waves to form an almost impenetrable barrier around the surviving sailors. The sharks would often swim towards the survivors, bumping into them to test for signs of life. The sailors never knew exactly when the attacks would come, and this took a serious toll on their sanity. Men would kick and pound the water, screaming bloody murder in an attempt to deter the sharks from attacking, but this only served to attract more and more of the fishy fiends, as it mimicked the thrashing of a wounded sea creature that served as a natural dinner bell for the hungry beasts. Every so often, a shark would lose patience and strike without mercy, rushing up from the briny depths to drag down a screaming survivor. Imagine it, hearing the man next to you let out an ear-splitting, blood-curdling scream before disappearing beneath the waves, never to be seen again. Some survivors recalled that the elements were perhaps just as deadly as the circling sharks. During the scorching heat of the daytime, men would pray for darkness, their faces blistering as the harsh Pacific sun beat down upon them. While at night, the water grew so cold that their teeth would chatter as hypothermia set in. Some would kick their legs and thrash their arms in futile attempts to keep warm. But again, this only mimicked the death throes of a wounded sea creature, making them a target for the circling sharks. As the floating sailors fought to survive, Many of them succumbed to the horror of their experiences and began to lose their minds. Some men even began to hallucinate, seeing islands that weren't there, or claiming that they heard rescue planes searching in the skies above. One such surviving sailor recalls the heartbreaking moment that one of his shipmates finally lost his grip on sanity. The man claimed he could see the Indianapolis floating in the water just a few feet below them, and that he could access the mess hall's stores of purified water. He made repeated trips beneath the surface, inviting his comrades to join him in drinking the cool, fresh water he had found. But the man was drinking salt water. He died shortly afterwards from the effects of saline poisoning. Then, on the fourth day of their harrowing survival, a Navy seaplane happened to be passing overhead, when they spotted the groups of surviving sailors floating in the waters below. One of the aircraft's crew members leaned out of the central hatch, waving down at the men. That's when the tears came. Tears of pure relief and salvation. They were saved. But out of the crew of almost 1,200 sailors, just 317 survived the ordeal. But for some, the horror pain and tragedy of the sinking would never end. Captain Charles McVeigh, commander of the Indianapolis, was one of the last to abandon the sinking ship. In November of 1945, he was court-martialed for failing to order his men to abandon ship in time, resulting in the 300 or so sailors that sank with the ship to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. 
cleared of this charge, he was instead convicted of hazarding the ship, a naval term which describes the failure of a captain to properly maneuver his vessel to avoid the likelihood of a direct torpedo strike. Yet aspects of the trial were controversial, as even the commander of the Japanese sub that sank the ship said that zigzagging the Indianapolis wouldn't have made a bit of difference and that he'd have always found a way to sink her. The disgraced captain was cleared of all charges, was reinstated to his position, and retired as a rear admiral four years later, in 1949. Yet, while many of the Indianapolis's survivors agreed that Captain McVeigh was not to blame for their ship sinking, the sentiment was not shared by some of the grieving families of the fallen sailors. Captain McVeigh would often receive Christmas cards from the relatives of his dead crew members, but they did not have a remotely festive tone about them. Merry Christmas. Our family's holiday would be a lot merrier if you hadn't have murdered my son, read one card that McVeigh has received as late as the 1960s. Despite being cleared of blame, Captain McVeigh never forgave himself for his failures as a commander. Even if it was during the most brutal and decisive war that mankind has ever known, Eventually, in 1968, McVeigh picked up a small toy sailor that reminded him of his naval service, walked out into his front lawn, and shot himself with the very same weapon that the Navy had issued to him upon entry into the service. He was 70 years old. Over 23 years later, the largest war in human history had senselessly claimed yet another life. Lunchtime. I count down the hours every day, looking forward to just this time. It's the highlight of my workday. Every day. I eat at 1630 hours inside the break room. Every day. The room itself is unremarkable. You could find it in any office across America. Maybe the world. Tile floor. White ceiling with those asbestos and cardboard-type cutouts you could push out with your hand if you wanted. There's a plain, formica-topped table that could fit five people comfortably. Six if that weird guy pulls up another chair to bother you while you eat. The one time of day you have to yourself. The room's size itself is too small to even think about getting a running head start. You might be able to take five steps forward and back. Maybe the same side to side. A refrigerator barely fits in the corner. Looks to be from the Carter administration. I put my water bottle in there for after lunch. A microwave from the post-nuclear era whirs on the counter. The Lazy Susan indeed earns its name. Quietly and slowly turning a Tupperware containing leftover taco salad. Above the counter stands a handful of cupboards. What's inside? No one knows. No one opens them. Must not be anything too important. Ding! Taco salad. Prepare for destruction. Two walls of this break room are covered in plate glass. The outside view is, like the room, unremarkable. A concrete parking lot. A tree. A squirrel. So exciting. Luckily, there are long vertical plastic beige shades that you can turn to shut the outside world down. Which I do. I review the first part of my day, as I do every day during lunchtime. Nothing much happened. Just like every other day. That's why this is the highlight of my day every day. I have four hours left. I work a strange schedule, somewhat of a split shift. Being that it's currently in the middle of winter, it usually gets dark by the time I finish my meal. I mean pitch black. Sadness sets in. Knowing my chosen food item has only a few bites until complete disappearance. Back to work. 
back to wishing I hadn't ended up here. Oh well, there's always the thought that lunchtime is just less than 24 hours away. I have noticed through the blinds, there is a car in the parking lot with its headlights on. Not uncommon, many other people work here, and there is multiple businesses around. It stayed there, pointed toward the break room for some time. I doubt whoever is inside is paying attention to where I'm at. After all, this is on the second floor. I'm sure they're just getting ready to leave after their respective workday. With that, I wash my Tupperware out in the sink, which I forgot to mention, and start getting ready to head back. One last look outside. The car is still there. Headlights on. I gingerly step to the side of the wall-length window, slowly pushing one of the shades aside. I get a closer look. Just a normal car. Looks like a Chevrolet of some sort. Too dark to see who is inside. There could be four people or none. It's too dark. Finally, I shake it off. I don't know why I've been so focused on this vehicle with its headlights on. Back to work. Back to dreaming of my next lunchtime. Before I leave, I always turn off the lights. Even though I'm not paying the electricity bill, I still think it's proper to turn a light off when you're not in the room. Flip. Lights off. Crap. I forgot my water. I consider just leaving it in there for tomorrow. One step back inside the break room freezes me. As mentioned, the lights have been turned off. So I am now in darkness. Looking outside, the car has turned their headlights off as well. Could be just a weird coincidence. Could be more than that. Either way, it's weird and struck me as disturbing. I left the break room and came back in, just to make sure I was actually seeing this. Yep, sure am. The car is there, now blending in with the darkness surrounding it. They just turned off the lights the second I turned off the light in here? Sorry, there's something that's off about this. After battling myself for several seconds, the logical part of my brain wins. Thankfully, it's nothing. Just get back to work. You still have a lot left to do. The quicker you get back, the quicker lunchtime will come. You can enter the break room once again, and this time maybe a bit earlier, when it's lighter. My head shakes, accompanied by a smirk. You're going crazy, man. I turned to walk out the door. Except... There is no door. Now, how do you explain this? How do you explain this? The same place I have been coming to for years just mysteriously boarded the only entrance point. I run my hands along the wall. I try in vain to feel where the doorknob used to be. I try to stay calm until the phone rings. And it's not my phone that I left in my work area. There's an old, corded phone on the wall near the refrigerator. This break room never had a phone, let alone one bolted to the wall. It has that old metallic ringing sound, like an actual bell is being struck in the innards of the phone, behind the big plastic numbers. One step is all it takes to be within arm's reach. With a shaking arm, more shaking than I'd like, I put the receiver to my right ear. Um, uh, hello? You love this place so much, don't you? Well, now you can't leave. Isn't that poetic? I pull the receiver back, looking at the mouthpiece with a puzzled expression. Like that will solve the million questions I have. Now I'm getting annoyed. Quickly, I put the phone back to my mouth. Look, 
This is obviously some kind of fever dream. Or maybe the taco salad was bad. But this isn't going to work. Silly. Just silly. You. Must. Pay. An insanely high-pitched sound burrowed into my ear after that last word. I threw the phone down and covered my ears. The sound seemed to fill the entire break room. I crawled underneath the table. The one that comfortably fits five. Six if that weirdo insists on joining. I think the floor is shaking. And just like that, it stops. Crawling out from under the table, I expect to see broken glass and general disarray, like an earthquake just passed. Everything is where it was. Good. I cautiously look outside. Oh, thank goodness. The car is gone. The door. Yes. The door is back. I reach for the handle. My water. Oh, forget that. Just get out of here. Stepping outside the break room into the garden. I have always liked the immaculate row of multicolored roses. My favorite flower. Pinks. Whites. Oranges. And of course, reds. It smells wonderful. It smells... There's no garden here. I have never seen a garden in my building. Ding! The microwave stops. The lazy Susan stops. My taco salad sits in its covered bowl. Looking toward my left outside. The car is gone. In its place stands an ominous figure. I can't see the face, but it is no doubt looking at me. Blinking and it's gone. No person. No car. Only 24 hours until my next lunchtime. The light is back on. Better turn it off. Don't want to waste energy. I used to be a scuba instructor in Bali, Indonesia. Groups could book me for a casual lesson or for like a week's worth of diving where they could earn a provisional diving license. So this one group books me. They're a mixed group in their early 20s. Couples and friends. Good people. Silver spoons galore. But I'm not one to judge. Our first activity was underwater walking. Now, I had never tried underwater walking since it was relatively new at the time, but I was keen to try it. So we pile into a little boat and take the short trip out towards the mothership. Now, this is just a naval term for a larger boat that smaller ones like ours can work from. But we go one step further to justify this, having spray-painted one of those huge gray alien heads onto the hull. It looked awesome, and naturally the kids loved it. Underwater walking itself was similar to the time I did snuba. Scuba plus snorkeling equals snuba. In the Caribbean, and that the oxygen tanks float up on the surface of the water, instead of being on the divers' backs. The other major difference to regular diving is that instead of having a scuba mask to breathe out of, we had these big old sci-fi looking helmets on. I mean, they looked like they were props from that old Lost in Space show that used to be on TV real kitschy. I went first, and the procedure was pretty simple. I hung onto the ladder with the majority of my body in the water. They placed a small foam rubber ring on my head to cushion the helmet, and then they finally put the helmet on. The second that it was on my body, I felt its weight forcing me to the bottom of the ocean. It was kind of scary, because I went down pretty fast which caused the pressure to build up quickly. I made sure to swallow and yawn a bunch to negate the effects of the pressure, and I was fine. Also, I could never really get a deep breath of air because as I breathed in, the helmet began to make a vacuum, 
and I would have to stop to let it fill in with more air. Then, two members of the mixed group of teens followed suit before a scuba diving man came down to be our guide. He handed us all a piece of bread in a plastic bag, which drew all of the fish to us. That was a lot of fun watching otherwise timid fish practically swarming us. There were metal guiding handrails in the ocean floor, which I followed. The two kids followed behind me. It was very difficult to walk because the current was surprisingly strong and the helmets were quite heavy. We found it all incredibly enjoyable though. I had been diving for years and even to me, it was a novelty. As I breathed, there was a constant, loud whirring sound as the water put pressure on the oxygen tube. It was kind of annoying, but it meant that I was getting air, which was obviously good. That's why it was so scary when the sound suddenly stopped. I was confused, but it quickly came back on after about two or three seconds, and I could breathe again. It happened one more time, and again it came back on very quickly. I rationalized it by assuming that my tank had run empty and they were switching it to a different one. No big deal. I didn't understand how they would run out so quickly, but I didn't think too hard about it. It soon came back on and I could breathe, so no big deal. After about 10 minutes or so, the guide points at me and indicates that he wants me to climb over the railing. I was very confused, but I did it after he made it very clear that that was what he wanted. It was kind of hard to see out of your peripherals out of the masks, so it was easy to get lost. I looked back behind me to make sure that the teenager saw where I went and didn't get lost. We made eye contact, so I assumed we were all good and then turned back around to follow the guide. He had me walking in a very small path between two corals so I went very slowly to make sure that I didn't cut my legs on them. It was hard due to the strong underwater current, my unwieldy helmet, and an occasional tug by the air tube as I pulled it taut. As I reached the guide, my air stopped again. I figured it was no big deal, like the previous two times, and continued on. I followed him a bit, and it still didn't come on. Five seconds without oxygen, then ten. I started to get confused. Was this some kind of a joke? If so, it wasn't funny at all. Fifteen seconds. I thought to myself, don't panic. They always tell you not to panic. I was panicking. I started taking quicker and quicker breaths, but I forced myself to stop that. Thanks to previous training, I knew that was the worst thing I could do. I spun around to the guide and started pounding my fist on my chest. That was the sign for, I can't breathe. He seemed to notice and started walking away. I could only hope that he was taking me to the boat. I thought maybe I should just try and shrug off the helmet and swim to the surface. I didn't know if I had enough air to make it. I didn't know if the boat was above me. I didn't want to hit my head. I didn't know if I could actually shrug it off, and I didn't want to get the bends, so I figured it wouldn't be a good idea. 30 seconds. I started to notice that I was getting less and less oxygen with each breath. Water was starting to seep into my helmet. I had to look up to breathe what little air I had left. I grabbed hold of the guide's arm so that I wouldn't lose him and also so that he would understand the gravity of the situation. I gave him quite the death grip. 40 seconds without oxygen now. My lungs burned for air. I saw the ladder of the boat. I knew that all I had to do was make it there and I would be okay. I must have gotten some sort of adrenaline rush with renewed hope, because I almost forgot about my lack of air. I fumbled for the ladder for a few seconds, it was hard to tell distances through the helmet, because it had a bit of a magnifying aspect to it. Before I grabbed it, I started pulling myself up. As I broke the surface, air came rushing into my helmet, and I took a nice deep breath. Breathing had never felt better. 
it was definitely the scariest experience of my life. And I categorically would not recommend underwater walking to anyone. Ever. I have always found creepy, mysterious things fascinating. I always have, even as a kid. My parents used to put me to bed by telling me scary stories. Scary stories about monsters, vampires, witches, and ghouls. I like to refer to these kinds of stories as old-school scary stories. These stories are nothing like the scary stories you hear nowadays about murderers and kidnappers. Unlike vampires and monsters, murderers and kidnappers are real, making it more frightening. The old school scary stories never scared me that much, because I knew none of the stories were real. They were fake. It was all fake. After all, there's no point in being scared of things that aren't real, right? Well, that's initially what I told myself whenever I would get scared. However, I had no idea of what lay in store for me as I got older. I am currently 20 years old. I live alone just outside of a town in a tiny apartment. I'm a student with a part-time job, so a tiny apartment is sadly all I can afford. My best friend Emily comes to visit me sometimes. We have been best friends since middle school. Emily and I had decided to have a sleepover at my place this weekend. Emily was going to sleep on an air mattress while I took the bed. The days leading up to the weekend consisted of studying, working, and sleeping. When Friday finally showed up, I got excited. I waited until Emily was done working her shift, and then she came over to my place. The clock was around 8 p.m. when she turned up. We had something to eat and sat down to watch a movie. When the movie was finished, the clock struck 11 p.m., Emily went to the bathroom, while I started tidying up a bit. My phone suddenly vibrated. I didn't check it at first because I thought nothing of it. Little did I know, that would be the biggest mistake of my life. After I was done tidying up, I realized that Emily had spent an unusual amount of time in the bathroom. I grew a little concerned about her absence, but I quickly brushed it off reassuring myself that she was probably just fixing her makeup or something. I sat down on the couch and checked my phone. It was a snap from Emily. She had sent me a picture. That's odd, I thought to myself. The concerned feeling I had a moment ago came back. Stronger. I tried reassuring myself again. Maybe she had sent me a snap to let me know that she was fine? I opened the snap. I screamed. I was horrified. How could this have happened? I was right here. Tears started streaming down my face. I was sitting on the couch, shaking like a chihuahua. The picture contained an unconscious Emily with the words, Looks like your friend needed a time out. I rushed to the bathroom as fast as I could. That was probably not a smart decision, but at that point, I didn't even care, because I had to help Emily. When I opened the bathroom door, there was no sign of anyone. There wasn't even a sign of a break-in or an open window. Nothing. How on earth could someone have broken into my home? I had been in the apartment all day. I started panicking. I had to call the police. I pulled out my phone and dialed the emergency number. A policeman picked up the phone. Hello, what's your emergency? I answered hurriedly. Hello, my name is Mia Kavanaugh. I live at 34 Hill Park Avenue. My friend Emily Fieldman has gone missing. You need to hurry, please. The policeman on the other line replied. Okay, we'll be there right away. I hung up the phone and sat down on the couch. My phone vibrated again. I knew I had to look, but I didn't want to. Another snap from Emily. I opened it. It was a picture of a terrified Emily with a knife held to her throat, and a person in a black mask standing behind her, with the words stating, 
Be careful what you say to the police, or she will get it. I tried to study the background, but I couldn't make out anything. It was all black behind them. The picture had been taken with a blitz showing only Emily and the person in the mask. From the looks of it, the person in the mask seemed to be a man. Regardless, how did they know that I had spoken to the police literally seconds after I had hung up the phone? At least I had evidence now because of the picture they had sent me. There wasn't a timer on the picture so I could show the police without taking a screenshot of it. That way the kidnappers wouldn't know I had shown the police. A thought quickly appeared in my mind. If they knew I had spoken to the police seconds after I ended the call, then they would have found out if I had shown the police this picture. And if they would have found out about the picture, then they might have killed Emily. I feared that I would have to find the perpetrators on my own, or Emily was going to die. The police showed up about ten minutes after our phone call. I opened the door and greeted them. I knew I had to lie to them. It was a false emergency. Emily had gone to the store without me knowing about it. I'm terribly sorry. The policeman looked stern and replied, Are you sure? Because if that is the case, you have a risk of facing a $1,000 fine or ending up in prison. I recognized the policeman's voice from the phone call and answered, Yeah, I'm sure. I'm so sorry. I really did think she was gone. The policeman sighed. Well, you sounded pretty concerned on the phone, so we believed you. We'll let you off with a warning this time, but if it happens again, you will be charged a fine. Worst case scenario, there is a possibility of you ending up in jail, so please be careful when calling us for emergencies. Yes, absolutely. It won't happen again. Goodbye, I said. Goodbye. Have a safe night and take care of yourselves. The police then left. I closed the door. My phone vibrated again. I knew who it was immediately. I looked at it. A snap from Emily. I opened it. It was a picture of Emily, tied up in a chair. Her eyes were red and puffy. It looked like she had been crying. A lot. The text on the picture read, Good job, love. We'll reward you for your cooperation. I sighed. What reward were they talking about? I'm not even sure if I wanted a reward from them. My phone vibrated again. Another snap from Emily. This time it was a picture inside a warehouse with some cars in it, with a text stating, This is your first clue as to where Emily is hiding. The picture I had received was dark, and it was hard to make out where it was. The cars that stood lined up looked really familiar. That's when a thought popped into my head. Of course. They are in the abandoned warehouse for cars. That place used to be Emily and I's hangout spot when we needed a break from the world. I knew what I had to do. I drove my car to the old warehouse and parked outside the building. I made my way inside. Nothing. The sun had gone down, so the warehouse was pitch black. The only sound that could be heard was my footsteps as I tried to find my way in the darkness. I took out my phone and turned on the flashlight. I tried to find a light switch, but I had no luck. I walked further in and discovered a door. I opened it, and on the left side of the door on the wall was a light switch. I flicked the switch, but there was no light. Of course, I thought to myself, this place is abandoned. There is no electricity here anymore. In the middle of the room was a chair. I approached the chair cautiously, afraid someone was going to jump out from the darkness and kidnap me too. But nothing happened. I looked at the chair and realized that this had been the chair that Emily was tied to. But she was no longer here. Hello? I said, getting nervous. I did what you asked me to. Now where is my friend? But to my dismay, no one answered. My eyes then fell upon the cars that were lined up. I spotted a note hanging on the windshield of one of the cars. I made my way to the cars and took the note. 
It read, Here's your second clue. I turned the note around, but there was nothing there. I looked up, trying to spot something, but the room only held the chair and the cars. My phone vibrated. I took it out knowing who it was. Another snap from Emily. I opened it to be faced with a tree. Why in the world would it just be a tree? I studied the background as well as the tree, and that's when I made the realization. It was the tree where Emily and I had carved into the trunk that we would be best friends forever. I recognized that one of the branches had grown in an odd way. That's what made the tree special, which is why Emily and I chose that tree. I just really wish I was right, and not that the kidnappers had taken a picture of another tree. But I had to go, for Emily's sake. I drove to the forest where the tree was, and parked my car in the parking lot by the entrance. I got out and started to walk up that all-too-familiar path. While walking further into the forest, a flashback suddenly hit me. A flashback from the first time we walked here together. Some boys in our class chased us all the way up here because they wanted to beat us up. We ran from them and hid in the woods. And that's when we decided that we would be best friends forever. After walking for a while, I had to turn away from the path and head into the thick forest where there was no path to guide me anymore. This walk took longer than I had remembered. Because of everything that had happened, it felt like one minute lasted twenty minutes. I started to pray to keep Emily safe and that I would find her in time. To be honest, I wasn't really religious, but I was so desperate. It was better to be safe than sorry. I started to run. I got there soon enough, but there was nobody there. I walked up to the tree, and there was the carving. Our carving. E plus M equals BFF. While looking at it, I smiled, remembering the good times. I traced my finger alongside the E in the carving. That's when my emotions got the best of me. I started to cry. I hugged the tree, wishing it was Emily who stood in my arms. After I had cried a whole lot, I had to start looking for clues. I let go of the tree and began my hunt. After a while, with no luck, my phone vibrated once again. A snap from Emily. I pulled out my phone and opened it. I could tell that the picture was taken in our schoolyard, in the place where Emily and I first met each other. I couldn't see Emily in the picture, though, and that freaked me out. I placed my phone in my pocket. I had to get there as fast as I could. I ran down to my car and drove off. I parked my car in the school's parking lot and got out. I had to find her. It was the only thing that mattered. I started walking down the schoolyard. I couldn't see anything. My head turned to the side, and that's when I spotted the place, which was where the picture was taken. My first encounter with Emily. All the memories came flooding back. The same old tiny shed with the same old tree beside it. I walked towards it. I had a feeling I would find my next clue, or better yet, Emily inside the shed. As I got closer, I noticed that someone had left the door to the shed ajar. I opened the door to the shed and looked inside. It was dark, but the room was illuminated by the moon. There was a desk and a chair standing in the middle of the room. I walked to the desk and found a note. The note read, Final destination is Emily's place. Can you reach her in time? I waited for the all-too-familiar Snapchat notification. Nothing happened. I couldn't stand here all night, so I ran back to my car and sped off towards Emily's place. I sat the whole time, hoping that Emily was okay. I couldn't think of anything else. I reached Emily's place as fast as I could and ran inside. 
there was nobody there. I admit that maybe barging into her house like I just did wasn't a great idea, but I was desperate. I tried calling out Emily's name, but no one answered. I searched downstairs for her, but to no avail. I went up the stairs but could not see anything. Her room was the last room I looked inside. She had to be here, I thought to myself, while slowly opening the door. What greeted me was the most horrifying thing I have ever seen. Emily's body lay on the floor. I ran over to her and held her limp body in my arms. I started sobbing. I couldn't believe it. How could this have happened? I hugged her even though I knew she wouldn't hug me back. I sat there for what felt like eternity, hugging her tight, like I would never let her go. I had lost my dearest friend, my best friend, the one who was always there for me, the one who knew more about me than anyone else. I spotted her computer while I sat hugging her. It was turned on. I lay Emily gently down on the ground again and went to investigate it. When I got to her computer, I saw that it was logged into what could only be the dark web. Did she use this? A chat was opened, where I could see that she had been chatting to someone. Someone that threatened her. He wrote things like, I will kill you, and I have your address. I know where you live. I could tell by the looks of these messages that he wanted money. I clicked out of the page because it was too menacing to watch. When the page disappeared... I found some videos of me on the computer. I pressed play on one of them, and it showed me while I was talking to the police on the phone. There was another video of me when I was at the warehouse, and another one of me when I was in the woods looking at the tree. They had put up surveillance cameras and filmed me while I searched for Emily. That's how they knew when to send me the snaps. I looked up and found printed screenshots hanging on the wall behind her computer of Emily and I's chat. The times we talked about the places I had been to, like the tree and the place we first met. That's how they knew these places meant something to us. What is this? I said to myself, overwhelmed with what I was seeing. My phone vibrated. I took it out and looked at it. Another snap. From Emily? My heart started to beat faster. A tear fell from my eye. I was so scared. I knew who it was. I picked up what was left of my courage once again and I opened it. It was a picture of me from behind. I suddenly heard Emily's closet door creak open. I whipped my head around and gasped. It couldn't be. A few years back, a few friends and I went on a camping trip to the Scottish Highlands. It was tough going. The weather was unforgiving, and the terrain even more so. But the trip was an overall success. No one got hurt. No one got lost. Nothing remotely unnerving or scary happened at all. At least until the last night when we arrived back in the small Scottish village we were due to catch a bus in. We were physically and emotionally exhausted by the time we arrived back in the small, highland village that served as our line of departure. Five nights in the mountains will do that to you. We had barely slept and barely eaten, so the sight of a small, greasy spoon cafe almost brought tears to our eyes. We drew stares from the locals, and to be honest... I don't blame them. We were a mess of bloodshot eyes and greasy hair. All of our clothes reeked of smoke from huddling around a fire at night. They were curious, but still friendly. The owner questioned us on our trip and took a great deal of pleasure in our fascination with the Highlands. 
It always earns you brownie points with the locals when you tell them they must be tough, hardworking people to live in such a barren place. We left with full stomachs and headed to the nearest and only pub in the village. They were equally welcoming, and even stayed open an hour or so later than usual, just so we would have somewhere to keep warm until our late night bus was set to arrive. We left the pub with about 20 minutes before our bus was due, having heartily thanked the bar staff for accommodating us, then made our way along almost barely lit streets towards the village's one and only bus stop. Now, it's important to note that the bus stop is located just next to a small bridge, which provides a crossing point over the river that runs through the village. So in the low light or semi-functioning streetlights, we knew there was a bridge. We just couldn't see what was on it at any one time. The minutes are ticking by, and we are all clock-watching. We can't wait to go home to hot showers, warm beds, and properly cooked food. There must have been less than ten minutes to wait, when we heard something from the other side of the river. A grunting sound, but I think we were too buzzed and exhausted to make anything of it. But the sound continues, getting louder and more vocal until we realize there's someone on the other side of the bridge. Someone who sounded drunk. Someone who sounded angry. I can't remember who, but someone was curious enough to gather the energy to go check it out. I wasn't watching, but I could hear their heavy boots against the metal bridge, moving slowly to the top. Then there was a humdrum of noise as they came down the bridge stairs faster than they had come up them. Grab the bags now, he hissed, trying to keep his voice down. Come on, move. We had no idea what was going on. In fact, I thought it might just be some sort of prank. Some lame attempt to inject a little excitement into the final hour of our trip. But one look in his eyes told me he was serious. I had never seen my friend that scared before. Ever. As if to confirm what he was saying, I began to hear the same kind of footstep noise on the metal bridge. Someone was moving fast across the bridge from the other side, making the same angry grunting noises we had been hearing. None of us wanted to take a chance, so we all grabbed our heavy packs and dragged them across the road and into a small, dark village street. We were fairly concealed in the darkness, but we still had a good look at our side of the bridge, each of us wanting to see just what had scared our mates so much. Then we saw it. A man staggering down the bridge's metal stairs with something in his grip, the glinting of stainless steel in the low light. Is that a machete? No sooner had one of us exclaimed that, the man honed in on the sound of our voices. He raised the huge blade in his fist, pointing it towards the dark alleyway that we had thought was concealing us. You! He roared in his rough Scottish accent, then began to bound down the bridge's stairs towards us, waving the machete as he ran. We bolted, hurtling down the small, dark street. We had no idea where we were going, but anywhere that wasn't in the immediate vicinity of this drunken, blade-wielding maniac had to be better. Whoever was in the lead must have had the presence of mind to loop around the block. If we got too far away from the bus stop, we would miss our ride, and the only other intercity bus to roll through the village wasn't due for another two days. He explained this to us the first chance he got, and we all rued the situation we were faced with go back to the bus stop and risk getting stabbed, or stay away from the bus stop, miss our bus, and end up stuck in the middle of nowhere in Scotland. It was like a military operation or something. We moved in pairs, covering each other's movement, and watching for any sign of our potential murderer. Somehow, we made it back towards the bus stop without running into him. We figured we had lost him, and started to relax as best we could. It was about five minutes after the bus was due to arrive, and we were starting to panic again. 
some of us had gotten it into our heads that we had missed the bus entirely, and we better start looking for a decent place to bed down before we ran into the machete wielder again. But they didn't have to wait long, as a few moments later, a familiar-looking figure emerged from one of the poorly lit side streets. Our collective hearts sank when we saw what he had in his grip. It was the machete. It was the same guy. Yo! He roared again before slowly walking towards us. This time we took a different tack. I don't know if it was the adrenaline or the pure desperation to catch the bus and get out of there, but we stood our ground. We roared back at him, pulled out our pathetically small Swiss army knives and dared him to try us. Looking back on it, it was kind of glorious. We went from terrified vermin, scattering through the streets to full-on warriors, willing to defend their ground. What happened next was like something out of a film. As we're facing the guy, he starts pacing back and forth in the street, zigzagging towards us, still waving his machete. He was obviously deterred slightly by our newfound aggression, but it obviously didn't deter him entirely. A horrible feeling came over me as I realized that one of us could well be about to suffer life-changing injuries. But in the distance, near where the road pulled away from the river's course, a police van came trundling around the corner, revving towards the scene and to our rescue. It was like the cavalry showing up in an old western. We were saved. Our bravado doubled, and we actually began to advance up to him pushing him towards the approaching police that he was somehow completely oblivious of. He only realized what was happening when the van skidded to a stop behind him, and a trio of burly-looking Scottish policemen jumped out and pounced on him. He got tackled, hard, so hard you heard the sickening thud of his head slamming into the concrete. But he had zero sympathy. We cheered as the bedroom lights of nearby dwellings flickered on and faces began to appear in windows to watch the melee. Then, as all this is happening, the bus shows up, coming around the same corner the police van just did. We continued to cheer, grabbing our bags and padding victoriously towards our ride home. The police wanted to talk to us about what had happened, but backed off once we explained that this was our one ride out of town. I told them we would be in touch to make telephone statements, but we never ended up getting in touch. We were all just so glad to get out of there in one piece. So this all happened way back in the late 1990s, when I was a college sophomore. Me and the girl I was dating at the time had been going steady for about 8 months, and since she was my first real girlfriend, my mom was pretty keen to meet her. And what better time than the holidays to introduce her to the folks. During the week before Christmas, my mom's family traditionally held quite a large gathering up at my uncle's place, over in Sandy, in my home state of Oregon. Pretty much all my extended family head out there year after year, from all over the Portland area, and since they had gotten word that I was bringing my girlfriend, the hype to meet her was huge. I won't lie, I was kinda nervous that they would embarrass me in front of her, but that anxiety was totally misplaced. She got on really well with all of them, and despite some playful humiliation, when a cousin of mine told her the story of how I literally peed my pants at the Haunted Mansion ride when I was a kid, they were a credit to me, and when it came to driving her back home, she seemed to be more into me than ever. We'd agreed to drive back down to Eugene at like 7pm, so I wouldn't be too tired driving back. But since we had such a good time, we stayed way later than we had planned to, and didn't get on the road until like 10.30pm that evening. In the hopes of making the journey a little faster, I ended up taking the Oregon 211 instead of just sticking to the I-5 South for the whole drive. Annoyingly, 
This didn't actually make the journey any faster, but point being, the Oregon 211 was pretty much surrounded by farms or these huge swaths of dense pine forest. So as you can imagine, big stretches of it aren't lit very well at all. And for some parts of the drive, we were moving through complete darkness, saved only by our car's headlights. But honestly, I wasn't all that worried about it. I was pretty good at reading a map, and once I was back on the I-5, a road I know pretty well, I figured everything would be all good. So we're just cruising along, in high spirits, talking about how goofy some of my family were, but generally my girlfriend was singing their praises and telling how she couldn't wait to meet them again. It's right around then that we hit a section of the highway that descends down this big old hill, leading up to the bridge crossing over Deep Creek. There, the highway is sandwiched by some of the densest forest you're ever likely to see, and there is absolutely nothing lighting up the highway, so the only thing we can see from the front seats of the car is like maybe 20 to 30 feet that our headlights are illuminating, and pretty much nothing else. But like I said, we're in high spirits, completely unprepared for what was about to happen. Right as the highway starts to level off, something darts across the front of us so fast and so suddenly that I barely missed smashing into it. I brake so hard that I almost give the pair of us whiplash. Then, when we're stopped, both me and my girlfriend are in a complete frenzy of, Oh my gosh, did you see that? What was that? There are plenty of deer in that area of Oregon. Plenty of coyotes, too but the thing that ran out in front of us was way too big to be a coyote. And something about the way it moved gave me this gut feeling that it wasn't a deer, either. The shape was just too slender, almost like whatever was out there had moved on two legs, not four. Now, next thing, and I know how completely dumb this sounds in retrospect, but my curiosity just got the better of me and I decided I wanted to investigate. So, and again, this was also incredibly dumb. I turned the car like 90 degrees on the highway so I could point our headlights into the woods. Yes, this could have caused a horrible accident if another car had come along at the same time I was doing this. But was I thinking straight at the time? No. You see, as a kid growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I'd heard a lot of stories about Bigfoot and Sasquatch, and I'd be lying if I said they didn't capture my imagination. Now, I am not saying that I thought I had caught a glimpse of Gigantopithecus or anything. I know the stories are mostly exact that... just stories. But part of me just wanted to be sure. So like I said, I turned the car 90 degrees, turned on the high beams and stepped out of the driver's side and onto the highway. I stare off into the trees for a minute or two, but I don't see a thing. Nothing is moving out there. The whole scene was as quiet as the grave. But as I'm looking, I get this feeling in the pit of my stomach and start to feel as if I had made a huge error in judgment. It was one of the most intensely terrifying feelings I have ever felt in my entire life a feeling like I was being watched by something predatory. I know it's a huge cliché, and the whole I felt like I was being watched thing is such a tired old trope, but I really don't know any other way to phrase it. My heart was pounding. The hairs on the back of my neck are standing on end. My guts just turned to ice. So without turning my back on the woods, where I expected the danger to come from, I started edging back towards the car. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, I practically jump out of my skin when I hear the car's horn let off one long, excruciatingly loud, extended blasp. I mean, it scared me so bad that I almost straight up pissed my pants, haunted mansion style. My first thought was that my girlfriend ended up leaning on the horn as she climbed over into the driver's seat for some reason, because she had done that once or twice before. But as I turn back around, I can see she's still on the passenger side, but that she's actually leaning over to push on the horn, in what was evidently a frenzied attempt to get my attention. 
I run back to the car and ask her if she's okay. But she doesn't say a single word to me. She just points off to a spot about 50 feet away from where we were parked. I spin my head around to see what she's pointing at. And that's when I see it. What was, without a shadow of a doubt, the thing that had run in front of our car just a few minutes prior. Lit up by the residual light of our high beams. What I saw was really obviously a man. But he was covered in animal furs. What looked like a mishmash of deer skins, bear skins, and elk skins. And on his head, secured in a way I'm not even sure, were these antlers. At the time, because of how close it was to the holidays, I remember the words, Reindeer Man, just kind of flashing through my head. Maybe in the naive hope that this dude was dressed that way out of some misdirect festive spirit. But he certainly didn't seem in any kind of festive spirit. Not in the least bit. I couldn't see his eyes because of this weird kind of head covering he had on. But I could see his mouth. And at first he kind of looked like he was giving us a smile. Only as I looked, I could see it wasn't a smile at all. This guy was just baring his teeth to us like the way chimps do with some kind of warning. After that, he turned and walked off into the forest, never to be seen again. Obviously, right after that, me and my girlfriend got out of there and got back on the road towards the I-5. It took us both a while to calm our nerves, but my girlfriend was particularly shaken up, and that's because she had seen something that I hadn't. And as we drove on, she explained exactly what that was. While I had been staring off into the woods, looking for Sasquatch or whatever, she noticed him out of her peripheral vision, but was basically frozen in fear for a moment or two as she watched him walking slowly towards me. Or rather, walking isn't the right word from how she described it. This guy was stalking, the way a hunter might stalk a deer. The way she put it, she had to summon pretty much all her courage to be able to lean over and honk the horn the way she did. Then, when Reindeer Man had heard the honking, he had backed off a little before I saw him. And like I said, he kind of just froze in place before disappearing. I did a fair amount of online research when I got home to try and find out if anyone else has had run-ins with this guy, but there was absolutely nothing online about him. There are plenty of crazy survivalist types up here in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm guessing he was one of those. But they tend to be pretty open about their existence, and sometimes even advertise themselves as militiamen or whatever, whereas the reindeer man seemed like he was living completely off the grid. I don't live in Oregon anymore. Me and my girlfriend during the encounter broke up at the end of college, but when we were still together, and I happened to be driving down towards Eugene. I always avoided the stretch of highway that I saw the reindeer man on. I have told this story a lot over the years, and some people honestly just think I'm making it up like a campfire tale or something. But it's not a tale. It's not made up. And it's definitely not just intended to be some dumb, spoopy story. It's most definitely a warning to anyone traveling on that road at night. Because if my girlfriend wasn't with me when he ran out in front of the car, if she wasn't there to spot him as he crept up on me, only to scare him off with the blast of the horn, I honestly might not be here to warn you guys. So please, this holiday season, drive careful, drive slow, and do not stop for any reason on dark, deserted stretches a forest highway.
Thank mm-hmm. you.